body. Just getting a few technical things set up, folks. Welcome to everybody and thanks for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. We're gonna start in just a moment. All right, everybody, happy Saturday. Uh, happy almost end to this crazy year that has been 2020. I'm John Heath, president and board member of United Homeowners Association II, representing the unincorporated communities of View Park, Windsor Hills, and View Heights. Wanna welcome uh, everyone who's joining us via Zoom. Um, We'll give it a couple more minutes and let uh, let some more folks come on board before we go over the rules and everything. Uh, why don't I ask um, one of the elders that's present? I see uh, Kim Jurgen or Tony Nicholas or Jesse. You guys want to give us a little nod or wave of the hand and give us your blessing to proceed because we always thank you. We always want to respect and honor our elders and make sure that we're in. Uh, in alignment with what they want to see us doing. So thank you for that. Uh, these are challenging times, folks. I know I don't have to remind you all, but I'm going to anyway, since we have our folks collected here. Uh, make sure you wear your mask every time you step foot out of your door. Uh, practice social distancing. Uh, don't take any unnecessary chances. Stay home as much as you can. Spread the word, wash your hands. Don't touch your face, your nose, eyes, etc. cetera. Um, I'm, I'm in uh, apartment complexes on a daily basis and I see and out on the street and I see way too many of our folk, a lot of young black and Latino folks specifically uh, not practicing those important habits and we all need to be diligent about that, especially now. Um, I wanna say thanks to my fellow board members that are on the call. I'm sure they're all here. If they're not, they're gonna get thanked anyway. Michael Hudson, Tony McDonald Tabor, Daryl Grayson, those are three co-hosts. We also have Richard Rice, Joanne Fountain, Dr. Helen Sellers, Aaron Raymond, um, Richard Rice, and uh, don't think I forgot anybody, but if I did, I appreciate you guys. Glad to have you all on this journey with us. And um, obviously could not do this without the support of our fellow board members and our community, most importantly. Uh, real fast, just by way of introduction to those, for those who may not be familiar, United Homeowners Association II was formed in 2016. Uh, the two is at the end of our name because we're the second coming, you could say, of the original United Homeowners Association, which was formed in 1979. Unfortunately, got dissolved through some political intrigue and, uh, and controversy um, that I won't go into here, but it's important for our community to have effective advocacy and representation. And that's exactly what UHA two is designed to uh, facilitate. Um, we're here for the best interests of our community. That's Windsor Hills, View Park, View Heights, unincorporated, uh, but also the greater community because we recognize that we're right across the street from Crenshaw, Bowen Hills, Crenshaw Plaza, Lamert Park, Hyde Park, Inglewood, Ladera Heights is right down the street. Bowen Hills is right across Stocker. 
So as far as I'm concerned, you know, we have these little distinctions and boundaries that define us and separate us. But at the end of the day, we really are one big community. And for some reason, the LA Times seems to think that we're all part of South LA anyway. And I'm, ha I'm happy to embrace that because that's our community. Um, one thing that we learned that I want to emphasize now before I go over the rules of the road real fast for today is how important it is to make sure that we're mindful of the importance of having different opinions and that's okay. You know, when it comes to matters of the community and, and organizing and advocating, folks always have very strong opinions. We are all uh, convinced and assured that we are, we are correct and our opinion is the only one that matters. But the reality of course is that it's really through the coming together of these different opinions and really trying to identify the facts and come to some kind of consensus on what's in the best interest of the community that's where we really need to be focused. So that's something that we have, in the four years we've been doing this uh, as an organization have recognized as critical. And we will proceed with today's meeting uh, with that goal in mind. Uh, we're not always going to agree, it's okay. You know, it's okay to be uh, firm and uh, vociferous in your advocacy for your particular uh, position, opinion or point, but we really do wanna focus on facts and just try to inform the community as much as we can. Uh, as far as the rules go, let me see if I can share that real fast without messing myself up here. Um, probably would help if I'd done this a minute ago. Hopefully everybody can see that. Okay, so here's our agenda for today. Uh, we're kind of right here. Uh, and I'll put this in the chat too, so everybody can refer to it. Uh, just real fast, respect yourself and your community, no profanity or personal attacks. Raise your hand or press star nine if you're dialing in so we can recognize you and you're welcome to send your comments or questions uh, via the chat to everybody, or you can send it to one of the co-hosts. You might not want to send it to me because I'm going to be a little busy and distracted. Uh, make sure when we recognize you that you say your name and your street or whatever organization or stakeholder you're representing so we know who's speaking. Uh, if your question was previously asked and answered, we'll move on to the next question. And co-hosts may interrupt anybody who strays off topic or just rambles on where our goal here is to get as much information in as possible and emphasize some Q&A and, and give folks a chance to participate. So that's the, the rules. The meeting is being recorded and it'll be posted online at our website. We're also live streaming it via YouTube. Let me stop that share and let me see if I can open up my chat window here. See if I was really good folks, I could keep talking and post stuff at the same time, but I'm not that good. Okay, there's the agenda. So the agenda's in the chat. Feel free to refer to it. We're gonna dive right in on our first topic, which is the view. Uh, hopefully everybody here is familiar with the uh, proposed 88 unit condominium project at Overhill and Stalker in unincorporated Windsor Hills. That's pretty much the Northwest corner of our community. Um, the lot has been vacant forever is directly across the street from the uh, Inglewood oil field. Um, see if I can go back to, oh, that wasn't what I wanted to do folks. There we go. So this is the project site for the view. It's a real oblong shaped site. Pretty much all this side is hillside going down to La Brea. This is Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Area over here. Let me change my icon over here. It's Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Area. This is the uh, city park, Houston Park. Uh, over here is uh, View Park, Windsor Hills is immediately adjacent. That's on a crest down there. So you can see this big 
five story building, 88 units condo project is proposed to be right here. There's a little retail center here, a uh, shopping center, motel there, Windsor Hills Elementary is here. Um, three things that we want to point out here before we go further about this um, and three questions that I want you all to keep in mind as we talk about this. First thing, this has been going on for nearly 20 years. I think the uh, Bedford group got control of this site in the early 2000s. And by the way, if there is someone on from the Bedford group uh, or the county, can you uh, ping us or let us know so that we can recognize you at the appropriate time and give you a chance to speak? We did invite the developer and the county, and we're not sure if they were able to make it, but we'll do our best to represent the details uh, if they're not here. Three key questions to keep in mind about this project, folks. One is really, should anything be built on this site, given the fact that it's located in a seismic hazard zone, a very high fire hazard zone, uh, it's right across the street from an active oil field, so you've got methane gas and other issues to deal with. And on top of that, the serious traffic issues, uh, we all know how fast traffic goes down, especially going south on Overhill and La Brea. Um, so those, that's one question to keep in mind. Second question, if you build something, what justifies building such a large building on a relatively small, difficult site? For all the reasons I just mentioned, uh, the new general plan uh, for 2035 that the county adopted has a specific policy that says thou shall not build in uh, earthquake fault hazard zones and very high fire hazard severity zones. So those are two reasons right there where the county is basically uh, going against its own policy. And then the third question is, why did the county approve a zoning and land use change on this site in 2015 without notifying the surrounding community? And how did regional planning get from recommending a full environmental impact report or EIR in 2004 to just pretty much waving this project through with minimal review? Uh, they prepared an initial study and recommended a, what's called a mitigated negative declaration or MND. Sorry for the acronyms, but just trying to be thorough. Uh, in 2017, uh, over our strong objections and ultimately uh, we ended up filing a lawsuit, unfortunately, and winning. That was fortunate, but it was unfortunate we had to file a lawsuit uh, alleging violations of CEQA, which is the California Environmental Quality Act. And we'll get into some of that uh, in a minute. But those are three key questions to keep in mind. Um, to give you all a little bit of history on this site. Uh, in 1999, and I apologize, all these documents are available on our website and you can always email us if you want more information, but I'm gonna to try to run through as much of this as I can. And again, save, save maximum time for folks to ask questions. In 1999, as you can see, uh, when Yvonne Burke was supervisor um, and Tony Nicholas is on this call too, and he was president of UHA for much of this, uh, Art Fields preceded him. But anyway, um, there was an attempt by a developer to develop all the vacant hillside along Stalker, basically from Presidio all the way back up to, don't really have a good map of it, but going this way, there's hillside there below the park and going east on Stalker. So this, this particular developer thought it'd be a great idea to build housing along that entire hillside. So given how controversial development in this area has been, uh, the neighbors and UHA at that time approached the county and the regional planning folks did this zoning study where they basically concluded that because of the difficult conditions and uh, the hazards that would be created by too much dense intense use of these properties, they down zone the entire area. Those hillsides, uh, this site where the view is proposed to be built had already been down zone. But if you take a look at this particular study and I'll just, I'm, trying to do a quick overview here. Um, so here you can see the commercially zoned lands have been subject to many development proposals over the last 20 years. Uh, and that's this site that they're talking about. Uh, the small shopping center is the little corner parcel right there in front of this site where La Brea and Overhill come together. Uh, the southerly part, which is our site right now is vacant, but has been proposed 
had the following previous proposals, 40 condo units that actually was approved in 1980 and never built. That was a two-story 40 unit condominium project. That seems reasonable. Uh, if you ag agree that something can be built there, a conditional use permit app for 168 room motor in that was denied, 109 room motel was denied uh, and so forth and so on. So, you know, not to, not to go too far into the weeds on this, but uh, I think you all can see the concerns that were raised here, constraints on development, the, top the topography, it's very hilly, concerns about geology, the visual impacts of building out what really is open space and of course traffic. Um, and this is 1999, so we know traffic and these other conditions haven't gotten better in the last 20 years. If anything, they've gotten worse. Um, and then going on here, specifically talking about the commercial properties, the study concluded the commercial properties are not readily accessible due to traffic conditions at Stocker Overhill on the Brea. The intersection was designed to limit all turning movements blah, 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 parcels are small, parking is limited. Um, just, you know, just a difficult, uh, difficult site to build out. And then here, you know, they're referencing meetings and the original UHA expressing uh, concerns about development in this area. So this has been going on a long time, folks. And in 2004, this initial study was uh, presented by LA County Regional Planning. This was for a project very, very similar to the current one. It's a five-story, 72-unit condo complex on the same site. Pretty much the only difference is slightly less parking. They were proposing to move or excavate less dirt. And um, I think there was one, one level of the building that was gonna be office space. Uh, but otherwise, it's still a big five-story building. And in 2004, the county reviewed this, and this is what I wanted everybody to see. The conclusion then was because of geotechnical concerns right next to the Newport Inglewood fault zone, that's a potentially significant impact. Uh, noise, you know, some impact, but not, not enough to raise to an EIR level. Air quality, they're exca excavating 14,700 cubic yards of dirt. Visual qualities, obviously, if you have a little single family community where nothing is over 35 feet and open space everywhere else, if you build a big five story building, that might have a little bit of a visual impact, I guess. Traffic and access, again, in, in 2004 now, the county planners are con concluding that there were unmitigable cumulative traffic impacts, and that was back then. And then uh, because the zoning hadn't been changed yet, there was a land use impact. So here you can see right here on the next page, environmental impact report required. So our real question is from then to now, here we have the current uh, initial study, at least this is the one from 2017, uh, you know, same thing, 65 foot tall building, uh, over 200 parking spaces. You know, we're still talking about roughly the same size building on the same site, but you get down here where they look at the uh, environmental impacts and there's a finding that, well, although the proposed project could have a significant effect on the environment, uh, we can get away with doing a mitigated negative declaration or MND, the full blown ER is not necessary. Uh, this is something that we strenuously disagreed with in front of the Regional Planning Commission in August of 2017. Uh, there was one commissioner who agreed with us and voted against the project. Something else that came up during that, that hearing, and I'll mention it real fast, is the issue of subsidence or subsidence. I'm still not sure how to pronounce that, but that basically is what caused the Baldwin Hills Reservoir to collapse, which is just north of this site. Uh, and it was determined from some geological studies after that, that the um, activity in the oil field uh, was the leading cause of that uh, subsidence, which is basically uh, subterranean earth moving slowly over time and, and undercutting the uh, structural integrity of whatever you build on top of it. So, you know, again, here we have a site right across the street from the oil field and nobody said anything about uh, methane gas, as far as I know, or subsidence. So we have some serious concerns about this folks. On top of that, uh, part of the entitlements that were approved by regional planning in 2017 was a conditional use permit, because even though they changed the zoning, uh, which we probably would have disagreed with had we known they were doing it, 
you still have to make these findings to issue a conditional use permit uh, that the requested use will not adversely affect the health, peace, comfort, or welfare of persons residing or working in the surrounding area, be material, materially detrimental to the use, enjoyment, or valuation of property of other persons located in the vicinity of the site, or jeopardize, endanger, or otherwise constitute a menace to the public health, safety, or general welfare. So suffice to say, we have some concerns about whether these findings were actually met in 2017, and we will be revisiting that whenever this comes back around. Um, this is just an excerpt from the, the ruling from the lawsuit that we had to file. The judge, as I mentioned, ruled in our favor. Something important to note here is as he's talking about uh, where the county planners went wrong, uh, this provision right here, LA County Department of Public Works guidelines cannot overrule state law. Uh, there's nothing in CEQA that supports these guidelines. Uh, the, the, the thing that they messed up on here, which is kind of interesting given what we're going to talk about in a minute, is that they took into a, a consideration all of the cumulative impacts from all the major projects except for the build out of Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza. So, and they, you know, they claim that they had some rationale for um, ignoring it and not relying on it. Um, and the judge said, hey, you made a mistake there. You should have considered that. Uh, the bottom line is you're talking about a project that's going to add more than 700 additional vehicle trips every day to an already congested area. So that's something that the ER is going to have to cover. Uh, we're going to, you know, try to see if we can weigh in and convince the county planning folks that they need to consider some of these other significant environmental impacts. But uh, that's probably going to be a fight. This uh, notice of preparation was just issued, and this is basically talking about the scope of the environmental impact report for the project. Um, comments are due on this by this Friday. We are asking, this is my letter to the board, which I won't go into. It's available if anybody wants to see it, but these are the three things that we're asking folks to do to help us with this right now. Uh, email the lead planner. Uh, let her know your specific concerns, tell her you want regional planning to include a thorough analysis of all potential significant environmental impacts. Uh, contact our new supervisor, Holly Mitchell. This is her phone number. I checked it, it works, it answers to her name. Uh, leave a message and let her know that we need her to be focused on this and moreover, make sure that regional planning is focused on uh, giving this the thorough review and uh, the, if we're gonna do an environmental impact report, we might as well consider all of these serious potential environmental impacts. And then finally, the uh, director of the regional planning department, I think she needs to hear from our community so that she understands it's important for their staff to um, respond to our concerns. So with that, I'm going to shut up for a minute and see if there are any questions or comments or things that other folks want to weigh in on on this issue and I'll post a couple of those things in the chat while we wait for feedback. And if you, I don't, Michael, you said that the raise hand feature was not working. So I don't know if people can raise their hand or if you want to just wave, wave to the camera. Uh, or put something in the chat, either way. Okay, Tony Nichols is raising his hand. All right, let's unmute Brother Tony. And Tony, can you unmute yourself? You may have to, you may have to hit unmute, Tony. There we go. Uh, go uh, ahead, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, you know, I was uh, president of UHA for 12 years. And in the latter part of my... Uh, uh, of my, my presidency, uh, this whole uh, situation with the view came up. Uh, you know, I must commend the board at that time and the community, how we rose up against, against uh, this project. And we thought we had won. We really did. Uh, and and, uh, and I, uh, I was so grateful to the fact that John uh, took up the cause uh, and uh, had to file the lawsuit uh, because uh, this is a, a terrible, terrible project. Terrible all the way around. There's just so many things that are wrong with it, you know, between the, the uh, 
uh, the traffic and 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 other uh, other elements of, of of this project, and I was just so pleased that uh, we were able to defeat it. But uh, I, I can't believe it. It's it's uh, you know it's like Trump. You know, he just he won't go away. It just keeps coming back. <laughs> that's a that, that's a that's a cold blooded analogy, but probably not <laughs> not too far off base. So I appreciate yeah. that, Tony. And you know. It's just, yeah. It just goes to show what the role that politics plays in this, because, you know, we could kind of read between the lines and, and figure out what happened uh, to, to allow the county to feel like they could just change the zoning and go, but really essentially go behind the community's back in yep. 2015 with no notice. So, you know, we'll, we'll continue at this point. We're really just dealing with the regional planning folks and talking with Supervisor Mitchell. She did, you know, obviously she just took the oath of office last week. So she's still coming up to speed. She asked, Absolutely. she asked for some time to get her staff together, but, you know, we can still give her a buzz and let her hear from us that, you know, that we're very concerned about this and we really, we need to hear from her. Absolutely. Well, I, I'll be talking to uh, Holly uh, very soon. And so uh, I'll, I'll certainly uh, be, be able to uh, impress upon her that she has, uh, uh, you know, got to, got to join with the community on, on this on this project. And John, I just want to commend you, brother. You have just done, uh, you know, just an unbelievable job. You really have. I, uh, uh, you know, and uh, if it hadn't been for you, you know, we may be looking at a, you know, an eighty-eight room, uh, five-story project that's uh, that's being constructed. But uh, but you, with you know, with your leadership, you have blocked this, and I'm just I'm I'm just really, really pleased, really really pleased, brother. Thanks, Tony. I appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you. And as you know, you know, it ain't just me. I've got a very capable board of uh, right. seven other folks, along with some very active uh, constituents and neighbors, and everybody has put their shoulder to the wheel on this one. And, and it shows from the impact that we've had. And that really, thanks, Tony. I appreciate that. That really does underscore the importance of, uh, of collective action, because, you know, the more of us that we can organize again, you know, everybody may not agree. We had some neighbors that really, you know, in fact, I'd like to hear from if there's anybody on the call that thinks the view is a good idea or, you know, wants to offer some alternative viewpoints. Um, but, you know, it comes a time where you have to look at the facts and, and make an assessment and figure out the right way to proceed to do what's best for the community. So, and here's somebody asking, is UHA against development altogether such as Whole Foods? So I'm glad you asked that, Miss Ashley. I will, I'll put this in the chat, but I'm going to read a little excerpt from, uh, if I can find it real fast. Uh, this is an excerpt from a letter that we just tendered to the Board of Supervisors the other week as they were considering, they had to, they basically had to go back and vacate the entitlements that they approved in 2017 when we told them not to do it. So they had to undo what they did as a result of our lawsuit. So here's a, a, a part of this letter that we wrote. Please remember that the county changed the zoning and land use designation for the project site in 2015 without notifying nearby residents after the entire area along Stalker between Overhill and Valley Ridge was down zoned in 1999 to avoid what was characterized back then as a permanent solution to the constant onslaught of development proposals affecting properties along the Stalker corridor. Contrary to what some may think, our community, and I'm including UHA in the statement, is not anti-development, but we do require developers to adhere to community standards and height limits. And we expect the relevant county agencies to ensure that everyone abides by our laws and regulations. So that I'll post that letter in the chat if you all wanna to refer to it, but I think that that kind of accurately depicts what UHA's position is. We're sir, I mean, I'm an affordable housing developer slash operator myself. So we're certainly not, uh, you know, we're not against development. We're not against affordable housing. We clearly understand the need for effective uh, development, the need for affordable housing that serves all income levels and so forth. So, you know, good question, Ashley. I appreciate that. And um, let's see, Kim, you're- And Johnny had uh, three questions in chat. Got it. Okay. I and see. Uh, followed by, I think Kim was after that and Alicia Smith. Okay. Well, I see Kim first. So I'm going to unmute Miss Kim Yergin and let her ask her question. Miss Yergin, the floor is yours, ma'am. Go ahead. Kim Yergin. Uh, yes. Uh, Kim Yergin. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Uh, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? We can sometimes hear you. my thing is, can we, hear you? we can hear you. Um, Kim Yergin, uh, with uh, 
Park Mesa Heights Community Council um, and with downtown Crenshaw, a member, but I'm here as a resident. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in, in regards to the view, this is, this is a, um, pretty much exactly why the downtown Crenshaw community-led purchase of the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall is important and paramount because the capitalist comes in all colors, you know, black, red, green, whatever. And they generally want to build something where, you know, it would profit them and the community, you know, can just go to heck. And our politicians are in cahoots with uh, these developers at certain times, you know, uh, because we know. We they, know. We because know. they they see they see the the money. Let me put it that way, you know, the tax revenue or whatever. But not to see how harmful a project like the view would be to the community, um, you know, is it's ludicrous. So in my estimation, this is why downtown Crenshaw's redevelopment project is vital to the community because it is the community that's involved. It's the community that will own it. And the capitalists and the profiteers will not be able to come in and build what they want. These yes. uh, 10 story buildings or whatever. Yes, and this I is why downtown Crenshaw's project is very vital to the community for just these very reasons. Got Thank it. You. Thank you very much, Ms. Kim Yergin. We've got your point and we're gonna hear from downtown Crenshaw rising momentarily with respect to the mall and they can definitely make that case and we'll have more discussion, but, but certainly the importance of organizing and advocacy for what's best for the community. Again, that's, that's what this is all about. Michael, you said there were some other questions? Yeah, there's, uh, I don't know if you wanted to address uh, concerns in chat from Glenn Sato. Uh, well, at, at this point, uh, since we, we, only uh, have, we only have five minutes, let's see if we can get you know, somebody that's got an, a question about the view specifically. Okay, you saw the other from John Eldon, Bertha and Heath, uh, Sherry Franklin and Alicia Smith. I think it was Sherry Frank, Alicia Smith and Sherry Franklin. Okay, let's unmute Alicia. Alicia, can you unmute yourself? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Question. Hi, everyone. Actually, I have I have more than a question. I have a okay. bit of a comment that I'd like to make um, okay. in response to Ashley's question. I think it's an excellent question. Um, Tony, you brought us up to speed with the history of this project. I live at 5146 Onacrest Drive, my husband, John and myself, we've been here for 31 years and the VIEW project has been around for a long time in terms of the fight and the battle. Um, what's important to know is, as you said, Tony, we thought we'd won this battle and that was all the way back in 2004. What, what I wanna to respond to with Ashley's question is that what some, some members or some people on the Zoom call may not know is that when this ugly head rose up again in 2016 and 2017, UHA 2 had just come into existence in terms of following the lead of the original UHA organization that Tony is speaking about. And I think it happened to the detriment of um, the politicians as well as the developer and a regional planning office because they considered this to be a slam dunk. We did not have an organization in terms of leadership. John Heath was not, you know, we, we, we just didn't. And yes, as a response to this issue as well as a whole lot of other issues that began to rise up with land development in our community, we formed our organization, UHA2. And it was, it was really like the sleeping giants and Certainly the David versus the Goliath. You mentioned, John, that, that Stephen Jones, when you read the report, he signed off on this mitigation issue on April 4th, 2017. We did not even have a meeting with him or be allowed to send emails or letters and comments to the regional planning office until after this period. So I find it really interesting that April 4th, he signed off on, yeah, we've mitigated all the situation. It's fine. It's a, 
you know, pretty much a slam dunk. So to, to, to address Ashley, I think it's important to know that, that when we began to bombard the regional planning office with emails and letters and phone calls, in addition to Mark Ridley Thomas's office, they did not expect this. They did not expect it at all. And it just showed the power of community and the power of us rising up and saying, you know, hell no to this. We're, you know, this is, this is not safe. It's not environmentally safe and with 88 units. And the other thing I think that's important to note is that, is that per the regional planning office's recommendation, which was certainly on our agenda, you, John and Tony, our vice president met with Charles Quarles across the table and discussed compromise and discussed concerns and discuss, let's see how we can work this out so that, so that, you know, it's a project that enhances the community. And in doing so, Mr. Quarles made it real plain and simple and, um, you know, um, adamant about the fact that he'd complied with every, everything required by regional planning and that he had no intention in reducing the number of of condos, bringing the project down, certainly eliminating that that three level deep subterranean parking, which I think is the thing that scares all of us in terms of you know being so close to the oil field and the fault line and everything that is you know part of that. So so it's not a matter of us not wanting to build anything on that lot. We just we just want it to be safe. And want it to be to be smart, and want it to environmentally just 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 really really be a part of a community that we all love and have lived in for many years. So, um, I think the other thing that John said, and then I I will <laughs> I will I will I will. I will I will yep. mute. Yep, be, that, be brief because we're running up against I, I know. time limit. Is, is that I think it's vital that we send those letters and those, those emails and those comments because we have new players in the regional planning office. Stephen Jones is no longer the lead regional planning person handling this as well as the new director as well as our new supervisor. So it's important that they know how we feel about this as, as, as much as we can and, and front load as much as we can. Absolutely. Thanks, Alicia. And again, real fast before we switch gears, uh, we put a couple of times in the chat three things that folks can do if they want to weigh in on uh, on this particular issue. You know, email the lead planner, contact Supervisor Mitchell, contact the head of county regional planning and just let them know that we want that EIR to be uh, a real EIR and not just be limited to uh, traffic and circulation. And we can discuss this more. We've got a section at the end of the agenda for further discussion. But just to keep things moving. Hey, John, I, I just yeah. mentioned I put in our uh, email at info at uhawhvp.org. If your question was not answered today, there were more questions than there were time, and I didn't want people to feel that we are neglecting them. There were questions about uh, receiving certain documents, and that's UHA for United Homeowners Association, Windsor Hills View Park, uhawhvp.org. In info at uhawhvp.org. Thanks, Michael. Appreciate that. All right, so let's switch gears, folks, and let's talk about everybody's favorite topic, the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall. Very hot topic, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of passion and a lot of activism on this particular issue, which we always appreciate, as long as it doesn't get personal. And um, we've got a couple of groups here that are gonna be presenting, and hopefully we'll have time for some Q&A and discussion. Um, I know that uh, Sheree Franklin, Roland Wiley, Dolores Brown, and Brenda Curry were going to be coming on representing Live Work, the, the group that's currently in escrow to purchase them all. And we've got Brother Damien Goodman, Philip Hart, and Damien, let's see if we're, um, if we have you unmuted, because I know you said there might be one other person. We want to make sure we've got everybody uh, slated to be able to unmute and present. I just saw, I just saw Damien and oh there he is Damien you're unmuted. Is there anybody else other than you and Philip that we need to uh, include? I see there are other members of the team here, but I think we'll handle it since we've only got ten. And I think Philip 
then I can, uh, Phil and I can take the question. Okay, let's, let's let Cherie, Cherie said they were doing another event early today, so they're, they're all talked out. So let's let you guys go first and then we'll, we'll hear from Cherie and we'll have some discussion. Go ahead, sir, the floor is yours. I appreciate that, but you know, they're in the driver's seat. Uh, they've got the ability to close and they've got more information. So it would be better if they went first. Uh, let's see here, Cherie, I just unmuted you. Do you wanna, you wanna give us a quick um, update on where things are with respect to the, the pending sale of the mall? Sure, and uh, thank you so much for pulling uh, this form together with the community. It's uh, so important that we have an opportunity to do so. We can't meet in person, which uh, I'm used to doing, but um, this is a, 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 a strategy that we need to have across many different things that are happening in our community, and I appreciate it. So as you know, uh, the mall is being sold by um, Capri Capital, and Asher, who is with Live Work, uh, put together a partnership team, which includes uh, the Bowen Hills, Crenshaw, Bowen Hills Crenshaw Economic Development Partnership. Um, our partners, our community partners are Roland Wiley, who's on this call, uh, and Dolores Brown, Brenda Curry, uh, Earl Gales, and we also have community development partners. I believe uh, Joe Roseanne is on the on the call from Vermont Sauston, Jackie DuPont Walker from Wardy DC, mm -hmm. Urban League, uh, and also um, I think I'm forgetting someone, but I'll come back. Um, so we, and that was just the beginning. Uh, we we mm -hmm. had a chance, a unique chance, to put in an offer on this property, and we did an analysis, and we came up with the valuation that we thought uh, would not break the, um, break the community structure that we have in place for ownership. Uh, and there was only so much you can offer for this project because it's a failed asset. Uh, it is not, uh, it, just like most of these larger parcels. So, so we thought about it and we put it in our offer anyway. And of course we, we can't, we don't have just free money to throw away because that's really what's gonna happen in this mall. Uh, people who do that have an ability to write it off on their taxes or um, depreciate it over time. And that, that's just not a way for us to use our dollars here in, in our community. And I would never support it on anything, not just the mall. So we wouldn't support it here just because of an emotional uh, connectivity. Uh, we have to do something in our community that allows us to be whole in the process. And so uh, we put in our offer, of course, it wasn't a competitive in terms of pricing. And uh, so we had also, prior to putting in our offer, we did two things. We reached out to all the other African-American developers to seek partnership. Uh, most said no. <laughs> and then we also uh, called all the other developers and we said, listen, there, if you're gonna be the winning bidder because you have that kind of free capital uh, that, that exists in the markets right now, uh, and we, and we want to stick to the points of this is an actual asset acquisition. Um, we want to make sure that there is ownership at the table and not necessarily on the real estate side. Real estate, and, and those of you who are in real estate know, uh, when you're looking at real estate, it, it really has um, two things uh, about it, but uh, you, you, there's a, you can have it because you like it, but also because it fits into um, a portfolio of, of, of how you'll be able to benefit from it over time. And these bigger assets, not just this mall, but every mall, I'm on the board for West Hollywood Chamber. We've got the Beverly Center in, in our, in our um, chamber. And so I can tell you that malls and properties and assets of this size, and I've, I sold Pebble Beach back in the 80s. I, I've done commercial real estate for $800 million. You can't get that today. They lost money. I sold money through Japanese trust funds. That's how I got involved in real estate. But the point is, is that where is the value in this project? That's what we want to focus on. And we think it's in a few things. One, it's in the businesses and the entities that are going to go inside. Who's going to develop the housing? That's why it's important that Jackie DuPont Walker and uh, I'm sorry, the other organization, Community Build, those entities can build the housing. We don't need somebody from outside. So, so we can bring in the developers that are right here from our community to build on this site. That's the first thing. The second thing is um, investment in the businesses. I talked to Greg Doolin. I talked to the businesses there. We need to help them compete. And any mall redesign 
if it's not on a single pad like they're on now, is almost a disaster for any restaurant. So we've really got to focus on how do we bring them into a structure or leave them there or whatever this new design is. We have to make sure we have businesses, other businesses coming to the table that want to do things that are black owned, that can scale up and go to other markets if need be. That's what real estate is about. And that's what would create the family legacies, ownership of those businesses. The other thing is that we can be at the table, in my opinion, in 100% in terms of who's developing, who's, con who's building, who's managing. And that in and of itself creates the, the jobs and the economic parity that we need to have. That's just another, this is a billion dollar project. And I work and I'm a builder. I built, we raise capital, we help organizations and uh, we've been doing it for 30 years now, starting on Central Avenue. Uh, it's when we put our, uh, my personal self put into the ground, a project that was built by us for us. Hey, Sheree, uh, so Sheree, those are the three things that I, I want us to focus on. And then Earl, Roland will talk about it. We wanna start those conversations now about design, development, building, and raising capital with the greater community. Sheree, can I interrupt real fast? Just, I don't know if I, maybe I missed it, but did you give us an update on where things stand as far as the pending sale? It, uh, so it's being sold by, uh, you know, Capri Capital to the partnership that Asher has, and it has received an extension. So, which is not unusual for a project of this size. And, and apparently it has merit if it was granted by the seller. So I will leave it there. And uh, I'm sure Capri can give more details, but that's where it is. Okay, thanks. Anybody else from uh, Cherie's team or can we switch gears to the downtown Crenshaw Rising folks? Is, is Roland going or not? Is Roland? Roland, uh, he just did a phenomenal job on our last presentation. I know he's, um, Roland, Roland, did you wanna add anything on the design element and uh, beginning to look at, we, we there. Is, this, is this him, Roland's iPad, is that him? Yes, it is. Okay, he needs to unmute. I don't know that he can. Yeah. I'm, I was trying to unmute. I can unmute now. Okay. Oh, there you, there you go. <laughs> okay. I, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. I'm, I'm not on, on camera, but I, I'm a mess right now. Like Cherie mm -hmm. said, we just finished a, a really great uh, charrette um, on Afrofuturism, uh, featuring all of the best and brightest Black architects in Los Angeles. And I'm telling y'all, they were bad. But listen, first of all, hey, Damien, what's going on, man? Good to, good to see you. And, and Phil. Good to see you as well. Uh, I think the design of, of the mall is definitely a reset. Uh, we had the Baldwin Hills Mall master plan, and now this is, this is, that's BC, before COVID. Now this is after COVID, and we have to totally reimagine, rethink, uh, revisit the entire design of the mall. We, we had entitled 1.1 million square feet of retail. That's obsolete. So we have to determine what are the, the appropriate uses for this site and how can they be facilitated on this site? Uh, and that is going to be an interactive process with the community to understand what their vision is, what our vision is. We are all, I'm a resident of View Park, we're all residents of this community. We wanna hear now that we're in this new, new place how do we see this, this site? What are, what are our desires? There, there are a lot of uses that are now appropriate for the space. And, and plus there are a lot of needs, open space that need to be incorporated. First and foremost though, and I wanna tell you, whatever it is, it's gonna be an experience, y'all. This is gonna be a place architecturally designed that people will want to come to just to come to. This will be a destination place. That's what I can assure you. However, any specifics at this point, I think is, is definitely premature. All right. Hey, we appreciate you guys being here. We know you, you know, got all talked out during the Afrofuturism presentation earlier. So thanks for that. And again, for folks that have questions or to circle back with anybody, we're, we're trying to maximize our time for that, but I do want to keep the agenda moving. Damien, you can unmute yourself and Phil and anybody Anybody else who's going to take the lead? Oh, you can unmute. Okay. Now try it. There we go. There we go. And can All I right. share the screen? Is that possible as well? Uh, yeah, that's, that's, 
should be good. So first, let me let me back up. Once again, John, thank you so very much for hosting this important forum um, and this critical community dialogue about multiple development projects. Um, I wanna back up a little bit. Um, before I talk about this incredible team that put forth a hundred million dollar offer for them all and said that they would go 5% over the next most credible offer. Let me talk a little bit about myself because a lot of folk here I know uh, don't know me. Some do and some don't. My family came to South Central in the early 1900s. They were the Blodgetts. I know you know about the Blodgetts, John, because you dropped their track, the Blodgett track, in an email recently. They were builders. They built the first FHA financed housing for Black people in America. They built the first African American bank west of the Mississippi. They built the first uh, headquarters of Golden State Mutual Life. They were initial investors in Angeles Funeral Home. They helped a, a young architect by the name of Paul Williams get his start. That is the blood that runs through my veins. Uh, and L.M. Blodgett, he married an incredible woman who was the daughter of Colonel Allen Allensworth. That's, my, that's one side of my family. The other side of my family, I have the pleasure of saying I'm the grandnephew of the late, great Bill Elkins, who I think was last involved in the most significant redesign of this Crenshaw Plaza. So it's with that that I come in this space, knowing that I've been guided my entire life here and I didn't even know it was, it was occurring. I'm pleased to be one of the leaders, but I am but one of this amazing collection that has become known as Downtown Crenshaw Rising. And I've lived in this community and I've struggled with this mall for a very long time. And I'm just so excited that so many other individuals and people who have been working their entire lives, far longer than in some cases than I've been alive, have been able to capture this moment. I wanna start with what was said by some of the largest socially responsible investor firms in the country. We cannot overstate our enthusiasm among our funds and many of our clients about the Downtown Crenshaw Project. Downtown Crenshaw is one of the country's most exciting prospects for building a just 21st century sustainable community and local reparative economy. It is exactly what we've been looking for. Its success would be a model and inspiration throughout America and the world. Ladies and gentlemen, the time is now. What we've been able to do by being bold while being practical and attracting the best of local genius talent and matching them with global leaders is establish a new paradigm for development using pr proven principles. And it couldn't come at a better time. We're in a national conversation about wealth inequality and a systemic anti-Black racism. And that is why we've seen such amazing levels of support. Over 1,600 members signed up in 45 days, 347 in a charrette and reimagining session that had to be done before we submitted our bid. Regularly seeing hundreds of people at our weekly meetings. We've taken an approach that we would be radically inclusive because we know there are differences of opinion and divisions within our community. It's why we've said everyone has to be at the table, no matter if you're a homeowner or a renter, no matter if you are a merchant or a property owner, if you have a stake in the Crenshaw community, you need to be at the table because that is the only way we will withstand these forces of speculation that seek to wipe out the gains that my family made, the gains that I've made, the gains that we have made. And so let's talk about this dream development team. Yes, we know we need to redesign the project. Why not bring in Smith Group, the design team that helped build and design the Smithsonian National African American Museum of History. And when we conducted that national search, it was clear that they were the right global partner to be, to, to be on this team based on their statement for racial injustice and inequality. You can see it online but not just one, but two global award-winning architecture firms, Mass Design, which did the, what's known as the Museum and Lynching more, more generally, but the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, and matching them, taking that global talent and matching it with local genius, Corey Henry. It has been a pleasure to see within those firms and the people like Corey, their black brilliance shine in front of, in some cases, among their white colleagues as they have been able to wrap their arms around this project in this community. 
And when we talk about the project, let's understand the very big and radical difference between what downtown Crenshaw Rising represents and why so many consider it a threat versus what other development is. When it comes to downtown Crenshaw, the client is not Asher Abbasir or Live Work or his investment partners. The client is the community. It's not a land trust. I wanna be clear and we're clearing that up anytime it's said in the meeting, but it's land trust like where the goal is to control the land so the vision can be identified and then it can be developed. It can be developed by individual partners that themselves would be great and wonderful executing different elements of the plan, community control. And so when we're talking about bringing together that master plan, we again went big brought in the second largest real estate firm on the planet that has done multiple complicated mixed use projects. And they work for us. They have no equity stake in the project. So it is not of their interest as to whether there are lots of $5,200 a month, two bedroom apartments like that monstrosity cumulus at La Cienega or Jefferson, or whether we want housing that is affordable to our elders so they can transition from those large homes on the hill into something that's a little bit more manageable for them. They help us find it out, but not just because it's one thing to have a great vision and a national partner, but where do you bring in the local partners and who better than Phil Hart, a giant within our community who's known every developer throughout the world who tells me that he got started on this development piece even before I was uh, of my age, who helped build the the most iconic structure in the 21st century for Crenshaw right now, the West Angeles Cathedral. But it's one thing to have an amazing development team. It's another to have the capital. That's gotta be a concern. It's what Capri's problem has been going back to 2018. And so we brought on the largest real estate capital raise firm in America. 171 billion in transactions in America last year, 278 billion over across the world. But it's not just them raising the dollars. It's not just them identifying the sources of funding. It's local leaders like Lamar Lyons, who's on the call, and Lynn King Tolliver, who's done over five billion in transactions, mostly with entities like Eastel and Lacera. And the uniqueness, because of the power that is behind this plan, based on the competency of the team, and most importantly, the community support, is the amazing philanthropic support. Literally, people wanting to just give us resources, large dollars to increase the community stake in the project. Making sure that if there, and there are going to be institutional partners in the acquisition because we will win them all, that the community also has an opportunity to own them all and see their returns. And to build that structure and system again, brought in a global powerhouse legal firm, Reed Smith, who are leaders in the social responsible investment world, matching them with Clark Arrington, a global leader, thought leader in how to bring about community investment structures. It is this team that has come together, that has said that they want to be about establishing a new method of development in our community where we own the mall, where we design it collectively and radically inclusive, and where we have true opportunity for community wealth building. The bulk of the presentation, which is voluminous, we have identified things that came from community surveys and charrettes. It's online at downtowncrenshaw.com. But I wanted to just introduce the team and give Phil an opportunity to talk a little bit about how transformative it is, because it does sound crazy that a community group would go out there and be able to put in an offer for $100 million and identify the financial partners that are able to build a $1.5 to $2 billion project, not one in our estimation, but this, this amazing collaboration is what has allowed us that space and has allowed us this opportunity to make an impact and build on the legacy of all of our ancestors. And Damien, sorry to interrupt, but just real fast before we bring uh, your colleagues on, two things I wanted to ask maybe you or they can elaborate on. One, you mentioned, you know, the, the change in terms of the approach from land trust to kind of land trust like. I think I know the answer to that, but maybe you can, you know, shed some light for the folks on why that was important for the structure to work that you're proposing. 
I saw a question come through the chat. Someone was kind of trying to figure out who you are and who Downtown Crenshaw Rising is in relation to the overall mall. So you may want to say something about that. And then finally, you mentioned Capri and the, the challenges they had. I think it would be helpful for everybody if you or someone could explain, given the lawsuit that Crenshaw Subway Coalition filed that also gave some problems to Capri in addition to whatever capital problems they had, just you know how you see you all's role moving forward, given that you know in a real sense, some would argue were it not for that lawsuit, we wouldn't be here because Capri would have been able to move forward and get their deal done. So just wanted to put that out there. Well, I appreciate that, John. And I'm gonna take the last question first. So the, the best part about that statement is that to the very people who are selling the mall, Capri has basically been gutted as, a, as the controller of the sale of the mall and they've been replaced by Deutsche Bank's subsidiary DWS. The primary investors in the mall are Lacera and public pension funds. They know better than anyone the reason why Capri is not able to buy the mall. They gave Capri an opportunity to raise the capital and he could not. And Lacera, simultaneous to them requiring the sale of this mall, removed all assets that they had under the control of Capri to DWS, along with other entities that were institutional partners. They said, and most people have come to our meetings, that they had concerns about Capri's performance as an asset manager, meaning they weren't generating enough, he was not generating or Capri was not generating enough return. So while as a person who believes strongly in using all tools in the tool shed to ensure that the community's voice is heard, I would love to see litigation be more powerful. In this case, his problem was that his financiers had lost confidence in him. But I also wanna just briefly point out, John, people talk about the, a lawsuit, but they don't specify what it was. It was a Fair Housing Act lawsuit. Fair Housing Act was written literally with the blood of our slain king that ensured that we would all have an opportunity as black people to live where we wanted to. We found that with 90% of the market rate units within Capri's plan that it was going to unleash a gentrification wave throughout our community displacing as much as 70,000 residents and excluding most of the black and brown people who would not have been able to afford those market rate units. So if we wanna talk about suits and we wanna be concerned about safety and views, let us also be concerned about the stability of a black community and ensuring that our residents and our elders and those who have made Crenshaw great have a home and continues to be accessible. This, the first question, what was the first question, John? Uh, land trust. Right. Yeah. Let me, and I'm working with these, so you help me out because I know you've been with it for a while. There's a holding company, in general, those who, can, who hold the land versus those who control the structures and build the structures on top of them. The general land trust model, and I say land trust like, is that you own the land, but the structure on top is owned by someone else. It is developed by another entity, right? I guess the best analogy I'm working on this is, is the church, right? We all have churches, everybody's got a building fund, right? If a church has a parcel and it wants to build affordable housing or senior housing, or senior housing on it, it retains control of the land it identifies the vision in partnership with developers, but they never actually sell the land itself, even though the senior housing or the affordable housing is built and operated by another entity. It's in so many respects the same. That's been our approach, that it's not about us trying to identify each and everything and build everything out because there are lots of great partners. I'm looking forward to Roland being an architectural partner in some of these structures and other members of the incredible teams that bid for this mall being part of the process, which is why I feel as an elder in our community, I think can, get, can guide that for us. But right now, the question is about, do we control the land and therefore can we control the vision to ensure that we don't get Trump Towers we don't get a plethora of $5,200 a month, two bedrooms. We get housing that is affordable for our community. We get park space. We get business incubation space. We get senior centers and youth centers and education programming. And the many things that we have heard from our community along the way, and we have the capital partners with us to go identify the resources when that plan and that vision is developed. 
Got it. Did you want to introduce Phil and have him say a few words? If he's Please, Phil. Uh, I don't see you in there. Where are you, man? Oh, there he is. If you could unmute Phil. He's identified. Uh, got him. Yeah, I see him. Okay. Phil Apart, you can unmute yourself, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. How you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you? Great, great. Welcome. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Quarantined at home since March 11th, so I ain't going nowhere. You got to do what you got to do, brother. Um, I don't, my main uh, point, and I'll be brief, is I'm, I'm a real estate developer, an urban planner, and I do development in cities around the country. Um, and I've been doing, my family's been in the Crenshaw District for 100 years. My mother's uncle, James Herman Banning, was the first uh, black pilot to fly across America in 1932. And the airfields that they used to fly out of in the 1920s and 30s are right where the mall is now, where West Angeles Cathedral is now owned by air, air, airfields owned by the Stalker family. So I have a uh, hallowed ground, the mall, West Angeles Cathedral and Crenshaw Boulevard. But let me just say in terms of the presentation, the two presentations that you've seen today um, in relationship to what I've done in other cities around the country is that we, you've seen two teams of black professionals who are interested in the future of them all. Um, my experience and what I like to do is, I, and then I, you, have, you have the third party, live work that's in escrow. Uh, and a recent project I did in Boston is one where I put black and brown developers at the center of the deal. The white developer was uh, brought in by the black and brown developers. What I would like to see here is that these two teams that you saw present today, figure out a way that they partner and become the center of the deal as opposed to uh, not being the center of the deal. Uh, I can facilitate that happening if everybody is interested in that. Uh, I know Brenda Curry, I know Sheree Franklin, I know Roland Wiley, I know Damian Goodman. And we should not be at odds in relationship to redeveloping this important asset in our community. We should be working hand in hand and not waiting to see what happens with uh, live work and DFH as it relates to Deutsche Bank, La Serra, et cetera, et cetera. Let's exert some control of our own destiny as opposed to being on the, 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 the tail. Let's be the dog that leads the way. Uh, I have experience doing this. When I was less than Damien's age, I think Damien is now 38 years old. Uh, when I was 36 years old, I developed a 75 acre inner city industrial park in one of the most racist cities in the nation, Boston, Massachusetts. Um, that if I can do that as a 36 year old in inner city Boston 40 years ago, it can be done in Los Angeles in 2020, 2021. But I would just encourage all of you, including Cherie and Roland, Brenda, Damien, myself, let's figure out how we control our own destiny in this relationship to the mall. It's, a, it's an asset that we all know is very important to our community. We know that malls are, are, are dying. I'm a member of the Urban Land Institute for the past 20 years. I've been helping malls around the country figure out how to re reinvigorate themselves, how to re become alive again. And we can do, the, do that with the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza, but it's gonna take us working together with our vision, as opposed to someone coming from Brooklyn and saying, this is my vision, or would you, do you wanna work with me? Um, so that's, what I'll say in general, in terms of how I think I would like to see us proceed. And, and, and in closing, let me also say, I'm a friend of Chuck Quarles. I heard what you had to say about the view and that 88, uh, I've been trying to influence Chuck in terms of uh, uh, taking a different stance. Good, so, I'm, glad to, I'm glad to hear that. I know you, I know you were at that, uh, one of those hearings in front of the Board of Supervisors. I was so, at but, the very first hearing right. in front of the Board of Supervisors and I saw then the number of 
people who came to before the board to say that they did not approve of this project. And since that time, I've been trying to get Chuck to rethink it. Everybody knows Chuck is a successful, hard-headed developer. Yes. Uh, the other thing I'll say before I leave, I think you're addressing Crenshaw Crossing today, too. Yes. You've got Jackie DuPont Walker maybe on this call. My problem with Crenshaw Crossing, I bid on that project uh, as a Black developer. There was another Black developer from Atlanta that bid on that project. We made the short list. So you had two Black developers, and the Metro decided to give the project to Watt companies. I went to bet to the Metro board meeting before when MRT was on the board, Eric Garcetti, Jim Butts, Jackie, and I said, in the whole history of the joint development program beginning with Hollywood and Highland, you've given out over a billion dollars worth of contracts, none of them to a black or minority developer. Shame on you. And so we don't want to repeat that same instance in terms of the mall, because I know you're, deliver you're addressing Crenshaw Crossing today, but I just had to make my opinion known on that. My project was called Crenshaw Gateway. Right. We appreciate those comments, Mr. Hart, and thanks for that, uh, that insight across the board. You know, uh, there's a lot to be said for somebody who has experience and, uh, and hours, as we used to say at Morehouse. And uh, you're right. Um, in fact, I remember sitting across the table with Chuck Quarles and a couple other people and the late great Maynard Jackson, probably in 2001 or two, talking about this very thing that you just talked about, Dr. Hart, is you know, how do we empower and engage uh, more black developers in projects in Los Angeles? So anyway, I don't wanna talk too long. I know we've got another agenda topic, but uh, Cherie and Damien, you guys are both unmuted. Cherie, did yeah. you wanna to respond to Let me just say something before I leave. Go ahead, go ahead. Your reference to Morehouse and the role of black philanthropy. Robert F. Smith, who, when he spoke at the Morehouse commencement and, and donated money to pay the the, the the bills of all the Morehouse students. He's one of my protégés. We grew up in Denver together. He went to East Denver High School. I went to East Denver High School. So he's America's richest black man currently. And the way he got that that way is because I gave him guidance as to how, what to what to do. Uh, his parents were school teachers in the Denver public school system. His parents, my mother, was their mentors. So mentoring is important. But I'll just end by saying, let's work together to make sure the mall is a community controlled community community asset. Yes. I love it. Cherie, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Phil. That's been our goal. Um, we appreciate you. And, uh, you know, we've worked uh, just as you in the community to drive a lot of developments uh, here, our entire team has, and, and we bring that requisite expertise to the table. But um, yes, uh, we accept your offer to bring this together. Um, that's, that's our goal. We're, we're not here, uh, and we're very, you know, this language that's out there about, you know, uh, if you don't know who we are and what we do, I want to say you should find out because we're in the door making a lot of things happen, and there are reasons why uh, we do the things that we are doing. So, and Phil, you know, uh, this site is, it's 100 uh, and uh, you know, million dollars. Uh, the seller is is still is in control of uh, Clinton. And if we are going to structure something um, for this project, we have to have some capital. And you're right. And we understand that the ownership in terms of buying the land is just one part of it. Our strategy for the rest of all the other money is to bring that to the table. It can come in the form of a Reg A plus that can bring millions and millions of dollars from unaccredited investors, which is what we have to focus on. Uh, from us bringing new markets tax credits, we can form our own uh, opportunity zone, which we've already done. We already have, you know, our team members are bringing uh, uh, dollars from their families, from their organizations to the table, millions and millions of dollars from all black people. So that's what our strategy is uh, to, to, to be at the table and drive the entire development project and make it as much uh, owned by African-Americans as possible. And I say that because when you're looking at assets across, it doesn't matter what, it's about um, leveraging it. Timing is important. Uh, if we don't have all black right now, what we do is we structure it so that there's a way to buy it out later in the day. 
So if we bring in opportunity zones or new markets tax credit money, let's get prepared at the end of that 10 year period, at the end of that seven year period to buy it out. Uh, also, we can't put all of our eggs in one basket. We have to put money into the businesses. If we're gonna build out quality businesses, it's gonna take millions and millions of dollars and their surrounding corridor. So we have to be strategic and bring all of those things. And we're about, we don't need a white firm to come and work with us. You know that I don't, I don't do that. So we got black architectural firms, black contractors, we can do that. We don't need somebody coming and being the oversight. So that, that is something I will say uh, to you. And we've negotiated to be the entity to manage the development and to drive it and to bring in the money. So if it's a hundred million now, there's still 900 million more dollars that needs to come to the table. Why aren't we owning it? That's what we want to see happen. And in the, in the minutes that we have left, Damien or anybody else, I haven't been able to see questions or anything in the chat, but feel free to weigh in or ask questions. And one, one other point that I think ties in nicely to the transition to Crenshaw Crossing is, Damien, you mentioned the, the point about fair housing and specifically affordable housing for folks that are in that low and very low income bracket. And I think it's always, I'm sure Dr. Hart, Sheree, and others that have experience in this know there's always a question and a balancing act about, okay, you know, we know that there's a critical need for that extremely low and very low income housing, but then how do you balance that and also include some mixed income levels where you have moderate income, working families, working professionals, et cetera, so you don't just have everybody kind of, you know, you end up with uh, segregated, you know, demographic uh, communities when the idea is to get everybody together so that there's some uplift. So, you know, that's, that's just a concept that I want to throw out there as well. And maybe uh, the folks at downtown Crenshaw, um, downtown Crenshaw and Crenshaw Crossing, too many Crenshaws floating around here, but uh, maybe we can discuss that as well. Well, I appreciate that, John. Um, in fact, it was our team that said that we wanted to have a truly mixed income project that was reflective of the community's current economic demographics, um, with as opposed to what is the traditional method of 80% market rate, 20% affordable, which is generous, that we would flip it and have it be 20% market rate, because there are some that make enough uh, to, uh, to afford a market rate unit in our community. Uh, include moderate within that and see it be 80% affordable at different levels. And the, and, the, and the deal there was that those market rate units would subsidize not just rental opportunities for very low income individuals and families, but ownership opportunities, and basically what we would consider deed restricted, income restricted condos. And so we've recognized that we've got a, a very large community with diverse uh, economic uh, statuses, but the reality right now is that there is nothing in the history of live work, nothing in the history of most of the companies, whether they're local or out of town, black, white, red, or green, that seek to see a community like ours maintain its stable black base, but rather would like to see, and it's, it's a horrible process to witness and to go through, that black base turned out and replaced with more affluent individuals who don't look like us. And so I think just in general, we have a problem. We've got control of the asset. It's not actually in Quentin's hands at all. It's in Deutsche Bank DWS's hands. They're the ones that Lacera, along with the other advisory committees empowered to control this sale. And they've decided that live work which even I think he's 38, 39, Phil, he didn't have your qualifications at 39. He is in the driver's seat right now. He's not present here today. He's not willing to have open meetings. He is in the way of our black community coming together to own the asset and develop it. Um, we are looking for community control, not conduits. And that's what downtown Crenshaw represents. Got it. Thanks, Damien. And in fairness, I should have mentioned this at the outset, but just so folks know what we know, we extended the invitation to uh, Asher Abbasera. You know, obviously today is Saturday, it's the Jewish Sabbath, and it's Hanukkah. So happy Hanukkah to our Jewish brothers and sisters. But that was the reason that came back as to why he couldn't be here. So we'll uh, we'll keep pressing forward. Uh, some somebody said something. Yeah, that's me, John. Darryl. Okay, go ahead, Daryl. No, I just want to make sure that we continue to keep uh, 
the rest of the audience involved in the conversation. So uh, there's not a lot of questions, but I did just want to point out uh, uh, a lot of comments uh, reinforcing what Phil said uh, and the importance of us coming together and working together uh, in unity. So I just wanted to emphasize that we've got a lot of high fives and uh, resounding comments with regard to that. And then a couple of specific questions. Uh, I'm just going to say them all together and because uh, they're, 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 most of them are very uh, similar. Um, you know, one of them is, is this a land lease? Somebody said, uh, you know, how do uh, members of the community get involved to make this happen? Uh, someone had a question specifically for Damien. Uh, there is no one living on the parcel now. How could any development displace the number of residents that you cited? Um, and that's pretty much the comments and questions. How long is the live work extension, someone asked. So I just wanna throw those out there and maybe some more later, but if uh, you wanna let some people respond to that if they have answers to any of those questions. Yeah, if we if we could real fast, because we're now over into the, the time for Crenshaw Crossings, but uh, I saw the question from Jesse about displacement. I think I know the answer, but Damien, do you wanna you want to take a quick stab at that, about the, the impact of how displacement works, given that there's nobody living at the mall right now? Right. There's multiple forms of displacement, and we talk about this a little. Uh, we've talked about it a lot in my other hat, Crenshaw Subway Coalition. Here I'm as a board member of Downtown Crenshaw Rising. And we now actually have the city of Los Angeles recognizing um, what's known as indirect displacement. Um, if you're in a, a rent control apartment uh, in Baldwin Village, directly adjacent to the mall, and you've got 2,000 residents coming in that make a whole lot of money, the incentive for those landowners which includes some of the people that control other assets like Fred Leeds at Malton Square. You can go down the list. We are not in control of several of the, the parcels within our community. The incentive for them to push out and pressure out uh, the existing residents is great. Um, it also leads to a, a process of exclusionary displacement, right? Where we begin to see that apartments that used to be 1,200, 1,300, 1,400, by having so many high income or high uh, rent units for high income individuals, you now know that when that rent renter leaves that you go from it being a 1200 a month apartment to a 2100 a month apartment, and that disqualifies people, many of the, the long term residents. And this is actually stated uh, in, in, in stable science and I'll, I'll drop some uh, additional links in the chat while I'm here on the methodology. It's what we see. I mean, that, that's what we say over and over again with gentrification. It is not as though black people are not trying to buy the homes. It's that we don't have the incomes to buy as many homes. So that's why you're seeing nine out of 10 homes going to not black people. It's not that black people don't want to rent in a proud black conscious black community. It's that it was a lot more affordable when those one bedrooms were 900 versus 1900. There's a limited number of people that can afford to pay those levels. And, and that's how we're being priced out and pushed out. Even the city of Los Angeles, I forgot about that. They even recognize um, this displacement index. Got it. Thanks. Kind of, kind of sounds like what's going on with the La Brea and Jefferson, La Cienega and Jefferson project, uh, among, uh, among others. All right. Well, we'll we're going to try to save some time at the end if there's some additional questions and, and commentary. But I do want to move on. Damien, you got your finger up. One more quick one. I, I forgot my pitch because this was nowhere near enough time. We wanna invite you all to a special conversation. Everyone who is here, please join us on Monday. Uh, I put the bit.ly link in the chat so we can talk even with more members of the team, go into some of the questions that we just didn't have the time to get into and talk in detail about this. Again, you're seeing it different from perspective because while I totally agree and, and believe and respect deeply uh, Mr. Abashir's Jewish faith, He's refused to, on other days that are not the Sabbath and during Hanukkah, to be open and transparent. We want to show how this process should be done by ensuring that everyone here can get any and every question they have answered. So we've got the bit.ly link in the chat. Uh, it's bit.ly slash dc1214mtg. We're going to continue the conversation on Monday. We hope you all can join us there. Thanks, Damien. Cherie, you had something real fast. I saw you waving yeah. your hand. Yeah, just if, if we're gonna enter into dialogue, it's gonna be important that people state the truth and the facts. Uh, I, I think we do need to do a deep dive on demographic analysis so we understand how to make sure 
we're developing for the people who live in our community. And then two, Damien, you know, when, when you talk about the, the African-Americans who are on our team, uh, I know you wanna build yourself up, but I'm gonna employ you uh, to not make disparaging statements about what we're not doing because it's not true. You're gonna need to stay on the facts and keep it factual because there's lots of efforts happening here. And our team has done more than uh, you and your team in this community. So we, we need to keep it factual. And we're here just as you are to fight for us. So don't make those statements. I would appreciate it. And I will call you on it. And let me just step in before this turns into a back and forth, because I do want to get to the next uh, the next topic. But again, you know, this is not the idea today is not to resolve all questions, controversies and debates. You know, I don't think we're able to uh, arbitrate what is and isn't factual 100 percent. But at least we can have a conversation and figure out. I think I heard some semblance of some beginnings of uh, folks wanting to come together and at least discuss how we can collaborate on some things. So let's move forward on that basis. Daryl, am I missing anything? Um, Sheree, can you tell us, do you have an actual time frame on uh, LiveWorks ex extension? That seems to be a question from a lot of people. It was 30 days. 30 days, thank you. Okay, and Damien, you had your hand up. I try not to leave anybody hanging, go ahead. <laughs> I'll leave it up to uh, Phil Hart and uh, our, our beloved former council member, Robert Farrell, to address the matters that have been raised. Thank you so much, elders. All right. We uh, have one more hand up. I didn't know if we had an uh, opportunity for RHAS. Yeah, just any other questions or comments, folks, just do me a favor and hold them. And I want to, to be fair to our, our neighbors and friends that are going to present on Crenshaw Crossing. Tony, I just uh, asked you to unmute so you can introduce um, Jennifer McElier, I think I'm pronouncing that name right. Um, maybe Michael Adderley. Oh, there's Jennifer. I'm going to ask her to unmute as well. I cannot believe that it's been almost a year. The last physical meeting that we had when we all came together was uh, last January. And it was, yeah. uh, you know, you guys came and made a presentation about Crenshaw Crossing. So we know you all have had some changes to the project. Uh, look forward to hearing about that, and the floor is yours, Tony and Jennifer. All right. Well, thank you, thank you, John. Uh, 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 there are there are some changes that we wanted to uh, present to to you and the board today, and uh, and so without further ado, I'd like to uh, bring on our our great leader, Jen Jennifer McElroy. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Uh, thank you, John, and everyone else on the phone. Um, if you could, I'd like to share my screen. So I'm going to do that now. Um, we'll try and make the presentation brief uh, so that we can leave time for questions. Um, as you've mentioned, it's been a year since we last presented. Um, and I want to give you an update on what we've been up to over that past year. Uh, just to reorient everyone, I think I imagine everyone on the phone knows where the project is, but just if you can see my cursor, we're looking at West Angeles Cathedral and the project that we're developing is both on the eastern portion of Crenshaw and on the western portion where the old probation office used to be. The land is owned partially one site by Metro and the other site is owned by the county. So this, to be clear, will be a ground lease. We submitted a response to an RFP uh, that came out in 2017, so some time ago, um, and I've been uh, leading the project team. Um, I guess I'll back up. I'm a, a senior managing partner with the Watt Companies, and I've been project managing this project since the RFP came out, and we were uh, selected by Metro to develop on their two sites, and they will retain ownership of the project under a ground lease. Uh, so over the past year, we've been working on our environmental document. I think John spent quite a bit of time talking about the environmental document on the view. So we've been doing the same on Crenshaw Crossing. Uh, there's a new version of the EIR, which is the most comprehensive version that you can go through and start doing all of the technical findings of the impact of the project uh, that we're completing. It's called a SIA. Uh, it stands for Sustainable Communities Environmental Assessment, and it's for projects of this size. Uh, and it's a slightly faster process, but we do the same uh, technical analysis. So that's 
study traffic impacts, uh, shade, shadow, views, air quality, noise, vibration, et cetera. Um, and we're just wrapping that report. The city reviews it, and then it gets circulated through the community for review and comment. Uh, our goal was to have it circulated before the end of the year, but things are just moving very slowly in the city at the moment. So their review is taking longer. I suspect it'll push into early January when this document uh, becomes available and we'll be letting all of the surrounding neighborhood councils and homeowners associations know when the document's out so that you can take time to review it and ask questions. Uh, once this document has been reviewed, we expect to have public hearings that's going to planning commission, um, and if we get appealed uh, to city council in the first quarter of next year. And then uh, construction wouldn't start until early 2022 and then will not be delivered uh, until 2024. It's gonna take about two years to build the project. Um, so I'll move on to just a quick recap of, of what the project is. Uh, so these aren't 100% final renderings, but they give you a sense of the scale and size of the project. Again, it's, it's mixed use, which means it's both residential and commercial. Uh, this was by request um, by Metro and LA County. Uh, they wanted four rent uh, apartments and they wanted ground floor commercial. And so we're delivering 401 units of housing and that'll be sitting on top of 40,000 square feet of commercial the vast majority of which, about 23 to 25,000 square feet, will be a grocery store. And then uh, we have commitments from some other local retailers, Hilltop Coffee, LA Create Space, a local uh, co-working group, and then we're talking to a local fitness concept to round out the balance of the retail. We'll also have 3,000 square feet of community serving space for HOA meetings, for whatever block clubs or other meetings that need to happen. Um, or other community gatherings. Um, we'll have, we've been working with Metro on first mile, last mile strategy. So that's how to get to and from the project, be it by bike, we'll have a bike hub, scooters, or other transit options. And then we also have a set aside for community art, um, which we're hoping we'll be able to tie into Destination Crenshaw. I want to spend some time on affordability because I know that's been a, a, a very big topic and, and clearly, uh, clearly was touched upon in the prior discussion. Um, it's something when, when we first received this project, I mean, when the RFP came out in 2017, Metro had spent two years prior uh, interviewing the community and doing outreach to understand what the affordability profile of this project should look like. And it came in about half and half uh, market rate or affordable. And, and that's really been the messaging over the course of our outreach. Uh, I'd say people are looking for different levels of affordability, not just deeply discounted affordable or market rate, um, but certainly the economic uh, environment has changed dramatically since we first took on this project in 2017. Um, so we've been working very hard to address that, as well as the feedback from the community. So when we first did our proposal, uh, it was uh, proposed with 15% of the units set aside for affordable housing. And we increased that to 20%, and uh, in October of this year made a commitment to increase that further to 50% of the project. So that four, uh, 200 of the 400 units would now be set aside as affordable housing. Um, if you look at the little pie chart on this slide, you'll see that uh, from day one, we had always set aside 20% of the units as affordable to 50% of area median income. And I'll talk a little bit about all these numbers because it can get very confusing when you're sort of quoting statistics and you start thinking about, you know, what does that really mean? Um, this incremental 30% of affordability that we're adding to the project will will be on the bookends of 50% of AMI. So that means it'll become even lower affordability. So 30% of AMI and all the way up to 120% of AMI or whatever market ends up being uh, and, and uh, workforce housing and what we call moderate income. So that's 60 to 80% of AMI, which is really, we were getting a lot of feedback from people who were saying, you know, I'm a teacher, I'm a doctor, I'm a first, excuse me, I'm a teacher, I'm a first responder. Um, I make too much to go into the lower 
affordability bracket, but I can't afford market. And so what we're really trying to do is not increase, uh, not only increase the number of affordable units, but also make it work for a diversity of income levels within the community. And, Jen, um, and I want to. Jen, I'm yeah. sorry, sorry to interrupt. No Just while, while we're on this point, maybe you can explain real fast for us lay folks that don't do this for a living. How do you, as a developer, make that decision or determination about? how much affordability a project can carry, because obviously you guys have made some changes as your pie chart sh shows. So how do you, you know, how do you make that calculation in terms of, okay, we know we need to set aside more affordable units. How do you balance that out? What does that equation look like? Thank you for asking that question because it's, it's, it's been a big transformation. When, when we first bid on this project, uh, we were funding this 100% with our own money. Um, and the 15% affordable was effectively being subsidized by some of the higher market rate projects in the project. The more you skew towards a higher percentage of affordability, the more you have to offset that decrease on the revenue side with tax credits and public subsidy. I mean, there are, there are no affordable projects that can get built that have a significant portion of affordability uh, that that can't do it. That can do it without public subsidy or tax credits. And um, you know, we've we've had conversations, and and I, I hark back to what um, Damian shared earlier that that he's he's looking at projects that have 80% affordable and 20% market. And I'd love to understand how how that is financially feasible because building affordable units costs as much as building a market rate unit. And so whenever you take you know a higher renting unit off of the table and replace it with a lower renting unit, you have to make up that differential somehow. So we're working with, you know, public agencies, the former supervisor, Mark Ridley Thomas, uh, made a $2 million pledge to help fill the funding gap. Um, we're looking, you know, we're going to apply for whatever funding subsidies are out there. And um, we're partnered with West Angeles CDC on this. They've been you know, experts in putting together these types of projects because you really do have to start piecing it together with different types of funding sources to the point where it's not really traditional equity that uh, is, the, is the key driver here. Um, it's really uh, trying to find different, different avenues to make up for those funding gaps. So it's, it's a challenge and it's been a journey as we try and really pivot from how this project was originally put together to how we put it together going forward. Thanks for taking the time to explain that. And that is, that's what I wanted people to hear is that, as you said, your, your equity investors, the people that put money into your developments, they're looking for that money back plus some rate of return. And they can't get that if you artificially reduce the rent to be affordable. So that's the challenge. Correct, correct. So um, as I mentioned, you a little mess. Okay, I got muted and unmuted. Yeah, go ahead. We can hear um, you. Okay, great. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, I just wanted to spend a minute on just explaining how affordable housing levels are set. So I'll take, for example, 50% of area median income. That is set by the county. And I know, you know, it's, it's very frustrating to have the average income in LA County set what the rent levels are in a specific neighborhood like Crenshaw. But that is the way the housing process works when it comes to affordable housing. So the, the, the rents are set based on what the area median income for, the, for LA County is. Uh, um, and, and that's what a household makes. And so when you look at this slide and the cutoff is you can make no more than 50% of area median income to qualify for these units, but you certainly can make less. The maximum income you can make for these units for a one-person household is 40, approximately $40,000. Now, we will be adding additional units at 30% of AMI, which is significantly lower, and then you will be adding units where the cutoff is higher for the people who make more than $40,000 a year. So the key is you know, there, there are seniors who are on fixed income who make less than this, who want to qualify for lower units, and there are people who 
you know, make more than this, but can't afford market. So the key is really having different levels of affordability that address different circumstances within the community. And then the corresponding rent is set also based on a county schedule. So if you're making $40,000 or less a month, that unit, the corresponding, if you're renting a studio unit, the rent is $986 a month. Um, and that's set for 2020 and the amounts get adjusted every single year. Um, so I know, I know there's a lot of on this page. I just wanted to stop for a minute, John. I can't see the chat if, if people have any questions. Let me see if there's any, um, any good questions here. I know there is, as you already mentioned, there's some, some comments about how is affordability determined. Um, and I think you kind of responded to that as based on the entire county. Uh, Daryl, Michael, do you guys see any other questions or hands raised? Um, Damien, Damien made a point about one of their partners figuring out a way to do a deal that sounds creative. And I suggested that he increased or share the, uh, the pro forma for that so we can look at that. That'd um, be great. No. Don't see any hands okay. right Don't see any other questions. Okay, Go ahead. great. Go ahead, Jen. Dam Damien, we'll come back to you. Go ahead, Jen. Okay. So I don't have much more. I just, I also wanted to make sure you guys are um, privy to all of the information sources that are out there on this project. So for the affordable, we cannot set aside units specific to the community because of fair housing. So we get a lot of questions about people saying, can we reserve units for people in the community? Unfortunately, we cannot do that, but the best thing we can do is make people aware of the affordable housing so we are collecting interest lists, getting people, you know, uh, on the list so that when the lottery happens, they're already pre-qualified. We already know that they can be um, uh, a person who can qualify for the affordable housing. So I think it's, it's very important if you know people who are looking for affordable housing that you get them with Erica Freeman with Los Angeles, who's on our team, uh, to ensure that they are on the list when um, the information comes out regarding these units. In the same way, we will also be sponsoring a local hire program in coordination with the West Angeles Workforce Center. Uh, and, and I can circulate this presentation, um, John, if, if you wanna share it uh, with, with everybody on the call. Um, but the Workforce Center, you know, the key thing about our local hire program, and we're required uh, to do 30% local hire within a five mile radius, but we are targeting 50% local hire within a three mile radius. So the people working on the project are from the community. And the key to having a successful local hire program is to get the word out early and make sure that the people uh, in the community who want a job have the opportunity to get tra uh, trained for the job that will be available. And these are not just construction jobs, but these will be you know, ongoing, jobs on the operational side, be it with the retail or with property management or security, et cetera. So it's really important that people know about this. Um, I would recommend, you know, probably early to summer of next year for people to start the training program. They have training programs that pay. They have training programs that give you your tools. Um, it's really fantastic. Um, so we're really excited to get the word out on that. Thank and then you. finally, mm -hmm. No, go ahead and finish your thought. Uh, okay, I was, I was just going to say, finally, you know, our website has current information, and then we also um, have launched an Instagram where we'll be pushing out information uh, more frequently. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there for a minute. I have, you know, some, some renderings in the presentation, but in the interest of time, uh, happy to take questions. Great. We appreciate that. Come come up, John. I don't know if you saw them or if you want me to look at them. Uh, yeah, you can read through them if you want. I, I was going to start with, um, it looks like someone asked about other possible uh, income levels. And I know, you know, Jen, this is something a lot of people don't understand how low income housing works and it's dictated by, you know, federal statutes and regulations, the Internal Revenue Code, more, you know, more detail than you ever want to know. But basically, in order for us to qualify these projects for the type of subsidy or tax credits or whatever financing is in it, it qualifies for you have to use these income standards that the federal government prescribes and it's done on a county by county basis. Uh, Roland asked, are there any black owned architects or other firms participating? 
And uh, I'll let Jen answer that. And Daryl, you can pick up some of the others. Jen, any? Well, we still. Go okay. ahead. Black owned firm. So we we still haven't picked uh, the GC and are hoping to be able to partner with a firm that has minority contractors. Clearly, our local hire will be reaching out to the community. Um, and uh, through West Angeles, we're able to source other um, vendors and subcontractors who are going to be hopefully either of the community or black, black and maybe not from the community. Um, but we are making a concerted effort to be able to reach out to the community, which is why, you know, we're, we're doing so many of these meetings. We partnered with uh, Tony Nicholas and Armin, Armin Roth of the Crenshaw Chamber, and we're really trying to make sure that the project also has businesses that are of the community. So as I mentioned, you know, the, the Hilltop uh, owners are from the community. LA Create Space um, is also a local group. So we're really trying to also make the businesses, as I think uh, Cherie mentioned earlier, that, that having the ongoing um, participants in the project be, be local as well. I'm sure you're already on top of this, but in, just in case, if you haven't spoken with uh, Brenda Curry or Ronnie Jones of Curtin Dunsmuir about general contracting, you should. Okay, thank you. Daryl, what else? We do have one hand up uh, Go ahead. from Damien. Somebody asked a question of uh, what happens if there's more than 200 people looking for units and what, how many units are reserved for disabled? So we, we don't have any, uh, there's no limitation on how many people can be, uh, can qualify for the disabled units. Um, there are accessibility standards uh, that the city requires us to do. I believe it's 7% of the project has to be set aside for um, disabled tenants, um, but there's no cap on how many disabled units. But I think to answer your question, that's how many are at a minimum required to be built. So we'll be building those. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, much like any project, and, and I don't know if Carolyn Patton is on the phone uh, from Los Angeles CDC, uh, you know, she, she can speak to what happens when your interest list is bigger than the number of units you have, because they just went through this process on the curve. Mm -hmm. You may be unfortunately mm -hmm. muted. I'm, I'm looking to see if I can find her. In the meantime, uh, Daryl or Michael, if you have another question, I know Michael said Damien had his hand up and there may be some others. Well, let me just get through these real quick and then you can go to Damien, Mike. Go ahead. Uh, is, is, local, is, the, is the local hire go all hires or new hires only? Your hiring go. That's the question. Is um, there, is I'm not sure I understand the distinction. Okay. okay. It, all, it should be all hires. So everybody that will be coming on to build the project, so the, the, the whole construction crew, we don't, we don't have you know, a team in our company that builds. So we would be bringing and building, you know, building a construction team uh, that we would anticipate would, would help be part of our local hire. So we'll hire a GC, they'll hire subs, and we'll be putting into the construction contract that it needs to adhere to our local hire program. And same with ongoing operations of the property. So all, 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 all. And we just unmuted Carolyn. So go ahead, Carolyn. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. I was trying to unmute. Um, just to give you a couple of about the affordable housing. Number one, I want to uh, kind of say is those 200 units are not going to be set aside affordable. They're going to be set aside, but they're going to be harmonized with the market rate. So you're not going to be able to know which ones are affordable or which one or a higher rate. So they will be harmonized inside these projects. Number two is our interest list is a list that we have, we decided to, we decided to do before the project start. When I went we, out in a lot of our outreach, it was like, we didn't know about the program. We never heard of it. So what we start doing is when we start doing the outreach, we start creating affordable interest lists. So when that when it's time for us to accept applications or if the project is progressing, we notify those individuals by email. And um, at our last project, the curve on 54th, we even called them 
the ones, because it was a senior project and some of them may not have computers. So whatever way on the interest list, they put they want to be contacted. That's how we contact them and keep them abreast of what's going on on that project. So that affordable interest list, we cannot start a waiting list until the project is actually probably 80%, 90% close to being completed, then we can start our application process and do our um, applications. But until then, what we're trying to do is affordable interest list. And then probably five months prior to the completion, we do an orientation. In that orientation, what we do is we help um, individuals that are applying to show them how to fill out the application. What I realize in a lot of denials is a lot of them don't realize that they, until they're denied, oh, I do make extra income or, oh, no, I don't have that income anymore. So we want to make sure that we keep them abreast and how to fill that application. So that orientation, we always, we do that to train them how to fill out the application, which is very important. So that's what we will do with the interest list. We'll notify them when that project is going to be built or when it's completed. We'll notify them when the applications will go out. We notify them when there's an orientation to help them fill out that application. So we try to give them all the technical support they need so when that project is completed, they can qualify or if they need to, um, what is needed to qualify or if they don't qualify, if they make too much income, they will know ahead of time or if their income change, they will know how to um, notify us to, to change their income on their application. John, um, two other questions came up. Uh, I don't know if anyone wanted to speak directly to what she said, but uh, there are two other questions I wanted to mention. Go ahead. Is this project labor agreement covered or open hire? So we don't have a project labor agreement at the moment. Um, we do have, we, we have committed to paying uh, prevailing wage, which is union wage, um, but we have not entered into a project labor, labor agreement. Okay, and will there be checks and real, <laughs> will there be real checks and balances emphasized uh, for local hire for people in the community or just hand it over to a local hiring group and you wash your hands of the process? I mean, we're, we, we're, there are checks and balances because we're, we're building on public land. So, you know, we're going to be subject to uh, agreements that have teeth that we have to complete this local hire. Um, and we're, that's why we're out here now. And I think I, I did see another comment that says, you know, are we asking people just to go get trained? I mean, the reason we're doing this this uh, now is getting the word out and that people will be able to go get trained because we're partnering with the WorkSource Center so that their training will be free. Not only will the training be free, but there are training programs that actually pay people to do the training. So, um, you know, this, this is our effort to show that we're serious about this. Because I think that part of the reason a lot of local hire programs fail is that they don't do the outreach in advance, and when the jobs show up, nobody knows about them. Has it been decided what size of the units will be? Uh, not yet. It's, um, I, Max, help me out here. I think we're about 700 square foot on average per unit. But with this increase of our increase from 20% affordable to 50% affordable, which we just started working on in October, we'll likely be doing bigger units and uh, higher bedroom counts. So more two bedrooms, more types, more types of units that also work for families. So there's gonna be some movement around in our average unit sizing. And someone asked if you could clarify what uh, Carolyn Patton's relationship was to the project. I know you mentioned that she was with West Angeles CDC, but uh, perhaps you could expound upon that for whoever asked that question. Sure, we're co-developers in the project. So they're alongside us uh, the entire way of the project. And they'll also be providing ongoing social services. They'll be doing a lease up uh, of the affordable housing. Um, so they're, they're a key part of this project. Will you negotiate a community benefit agreement with local constituency groups? Um, 
I don't know if we're doing that yet because we, we may be moving forward with a development agreement, but first we have to get through our process with Metro and LA County and get our entitlements. Um, certainly the project is coming with community benefits, um, but we, we're getting that request from a lot of different community groups. Um, so I'm gonna reserve comment on that until we get through an entitlement process. Okay. Um, well, what, well, what companies, oops, where'd that go? Huh. What, well, what companies release their pro forma? Um, I think that's a fair question. I mean, I, I, I have to clear it with our public partners um, and understand, you know, if, if they're good with that, but um, we can show you exactly how, how this works. And, and usually I know, Jen, if you guys are applying for public subsidy, which you obviously are, then, you know, there will be a public facing uh, model of the project. So I'm sure you guys will be okay sharing that. Anything mm -hmm. else, Daryl, from, uh, from the audience questions? Uh, looks like that's the last question for right now. Okay. I see Damien's got his hands up and he's putting his finger up. So let's unmute Damien. Go ahead, sir. Well, I appreciate it, John. And uh, again, I'm going to put on my Crenshaw Subway Coalition hat here. Um, there's, a, there's a bit of a challenge that we as an organization have with this project and it's because it's on public land. The city of Los Angeles last year adopted a ordinance that 100% of its public land that went toward housing would be for affordable housing. And it's a response to both the displacement crisis and gentrification and homelessness crisis that we see that disproportionately affects black people. And when it comes to this site specifically, Back when Phil uh, Washington, the CEO of Metro, came to the community in 2016 at a forum, ironically, at the Crenshaw Mall, we asked him that question as to whether he would make a commitment, because Metro has yet to adopt a similar policy, that on the parcels that Metro was engaged in, that they would be 100% affordable on the public land, because it's so few. There are miles of Crenshaw that we'll see market rate housing in the future and there's so few public land opportunities to actually create housing that's affordable. And when we talk about affordability, I think we gotta say specific numbers. Affordable housing up to the 80% level allows a family of four that makes up to $90,000 a year to qualify. When it comes to the moderate level, it's a similar number, right? And so these are numbers that are often definitely out of reach. They're not the type of folk who are in danger of being displaced. And in so many respects, the depth of affordability, the ability to allow those who are in our community that are making half of that and less is on the public sites. So while we definitely applaud getting up from what was 15 to 50, it needs to be a hundred, like it is on the east side extension, like it will be on city sites. And until we see that, we're gonna have issues with the project as a whole because literally, literally within a two mile radius of this site, there are over 3000 market rate units being built and not enough housing that is affordable for those that have held down this community for a very long time and the seniors who are on fixed income. And I think that this is a last point, the, the, the request or the, the, the increased affordability came solely because our coalition and other civil rights leaders went directly to the Metro board, which also has the county boards of supervisors and made it, and they were astonished that this site was not 100% affordable, right? So I think we still have a voice. We still have a role talking to the county supervisor, talking to the Metro board to get this to be a project that is actually affordable to our community. So to Damien and, and everyone on the call, one thing that I know I would like to see just from my own uh, knowledge and I'm sure you guys probably have this data is a breakdown of you just cited some very specific demographics within I think you said a mile or a mile and a half radius of the site. If you could share that data as far as what the income levels are like, I think that would be uh, that would be instructive for us and everybody else that's trying to do stuff in this area. And Jen, I don't know if you have any of that data or if you wanted to, you know, follow up or weigh in on that. Sure. I mean, we have the same data Damien has, and you know, uh, as Damien mentioned, it's, it's we've we've come from uh, fifteen percent to fifty percent, and um, as we explained, there are trade offs. You know, you you have to find the money somewhere, right? You still have to build the units, whether they're affordable 
or market rate. And the audience, I think, Damien, for what you just shared is, is really the Metro board and it's LA County because we were hired to develop the land. Um, they set the guidelines and we've been trying to bend and shift and restructure this project to meet what we're hearing from the community. And it is a journey, it will, it will continue to be a journey and it'll change the entire composition of how the project's put together to take it to 100% affordable. But I wanna be clear, there's not Watt companies who is opposed to making this a 100% affordable project. It's just the economic of it that has to change to make it be such. And so, you know, we are working very hard to increase the amount of affordability here. And uh, all I can say is we're going to continue to listen. I know you're going to continue to come to our hearings. And I, if Phil Washington came to the community before this project was put out for a proposal, I, I can't help that when the proposal came out, it was asking for a mixed income project. So, you know, we're, we're here. I'm here on a Saturday listening, and I'm, I've, we've been at many meetings together. And so you can see, you know, we've, we've changed, right? And so, you know, I'd love to see your 80% uh, affordable, 20% market model, how you put that together. Um, you know, I think all developers right now are really struggling to figure out how to make the numbers work. It's a tough environment. Um, and there are limited public resources, too. So, you know, I, I, I understand where you're coming from. And I don't, I, I, straight up. Yeah, thanks, Jen. And that, hang on one second, Damien. That, that actually, I'm glad that you brought that point up because really, this is where we need to go as a community, right? Just figuring out how do you do develop, how do you do the development that we need and how do you do it in a way that's predictable so you don't have the politicians on one side making promises and then, you know, here come the developers and the community folks trying to figure out how to make it work and the, the, the two ends aren't meeting. So that's, that's something that's a bigger theme and an ongoing topic. Hold your thought, Damien, if you don't mind. I see Mr. Tabor. Go. Uh... I've got to go. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thanks, man. I'm going to unmute Danny Tabor and uh, let him step in. Danny? I think, sorry, man. I think I muted you. See if you can unmute. Go ahead. All right. There we go. We, we had to work together to get unmuted. Not a problem. Right. Uh, a comment relative to the community benefit agreement. Uh, and, and Jim, um, we appreciate your, your explanation and attempt to walk uh, intelligently through the discussion about affordability and, and building affordable housing. I look forward to seeing both the 80 to 20% uh, framework, financing framework, as well as yours at a later point. But to the point on community benefit agreements, they are typically ne negotiated by community stakeholders with a developer prior to entitlements being granted because the negotiation takes into consideration the entitlement process, the scope of the development, the intent of the developer with respect to entities that are included within the frame of the broader development uh, and the needs that the community believes it has to have uh, either points of mitigation identified and agreed upon or opportunities uh, agreed upon. So a negotiation, for example, about the number of local contractors and the type of contract work they do or negotiation about the type of training that would go in uh, once the project begins and how that comes out or a negotiation about public right of way usage, uh, landscape, uh, streetscapes, those types of things are typically negotiated in a community, community bit of agreement. So it needs to be done prior to entitlement. So I just wanted to pull that out so that if there's an interest on the part of nine homeowners or the empowerment council from the area to sit down and develop a plan, then the community comes together and then we approach you as a developer to begin the process of negotiating uh, right along the frame of, of, of uh, your entitlement process. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. So I, I just want to clarify the challenge is if this becomes a predominantly affordable housing project, then it can't afford additional community benefit because it's a hundred percent put together with public subsidy. It, it, it then be, it becomes a completely different project than your traditional, a developer comes into the market, they're building a bunch of market rate housing, they're going to impact traffic and there's all sorts of, you know, challenges that they bring into the community that you negotiate away through a, a development agreement. In this case, 
we're, we're trying to change this into a predominantly affordable project. And so um, it's, my concern is there, there may be no ability to do a development agreement because there's, there's no money left in the project to, to fit it in. So um, I think until we know what the final affordability composition is going to be here, it's very difficult for us to commit to how this is how, to a community benefit agreement because we need to figure out how to pay for it um, because it's, it's dramatically changing from what we originally envisioned. And that, again, I appreciate the back and forth on this because this is just really helping me realize that we need to do some more advocacy and education work so that more of our folks understand, you know, how, how development gets done. You know, like Danny was explaining the process, you know, when you have a, a discussion about community benefits, what entitlements are and, and how important that is and just how to fit all those pieces together because we got, we're in a situation now where we literally cannot build our way out of this affordable housing crisis. We're gonna to have to be smart enough to look at every avenue short of the stuff, that, the crazy stuff that's come out of Sacramento where people are talking about uh, tearing, tearing up single family communities and trying to add density. That doesn't make a lot of sense, but there are some good ideas that, uh, and we need to look at all of them and need to do it fast. Go ahead, yeah, real quick, uh, Always an important hot topic, parking. Uh, Jen, that you mentioned, 502 parking spaces are residents of the 401 units uh, assigned parking spaces and how many spaces for retail? So uh, this is another negotiating point that we're working through with Metro. Uh, as many of you can imagine, they are actually wanting to have this park as as with as few parking stalls as possible because they want people to use the train. So we had to negotiate with them to get one stall per unit and half a stall per affordable unit. But that was when we had only 81 affordable units. Now that we're increasing the amount of affordability, we wanna increase the amount of parking because if we were stuck with half a stall per 200 affordable units, so that's 100 stalls for affordable units, that's not sufficient. And so we're trying to see if we can increase that. Um, so to be clear, we're, we're targeting about one stall per unit, and we are decoupling the, the parking from the unit to encourage people to maybe not take a parking stall in exchange for lower rent. Good so luck. hopefully... Uh, hopefully that'll free up some some stalls for people who want more than one stall, and then the commercial is parked at three per thousand. And and I have to be, I have to tell you it's it's been a battle. I mean we originally were only allocated two stalls per thousand for the commercial, which makes it very difficult to lease. Um, so we we increased it to three, and even on the residential, getting up to one per per market rate unit was was a real challenge. Um, so we understand that. You know, the community would like to see more parking than less. And we're working with the immediately adjacent communities on preferential parking districts and whatever we can do uh, to, to lessen the impact on parking. Uh, but but we've, we've been fighting that fight, trying to get as much projects as possible. Outstanding. I know I saw one other hand and it's now 4.06 and we said we would wrap it up by four o'clock. So if you all are good continuing, I have no problem. You know, I like to run my mouth. <laughs> Sheree, I think you had your hand up. Can you unmute? Go ahead. Yes. Um, a few things. One, um, regarding housing, uh, one of the things we have to do is advocate at the city level. As you know, uh, John and, and also Jen, um, there's only so many dollars for subsidies. So if, we, if we're trying to build affordable housing, and, and by the way, um, uh, we have the commitment to build as much affordable housing as we can get money for at the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza as well. So when you look at that regionally and how money is divided in the state of California by in between Northern California and Southern California, and then also locally, the competitiveness across the city in terms of tax credits, particularly the 9% that gives you that affordability. And then the, the money that's available at the state, it's competitive. So we would be looking at almost between the number of units we wanna do by in between uh, the housing developments that are on the table uh, a, a period of time, about 10 years, right? To really get in there, who's gonna get it? We're all gonna be competing against one another. That's another thing regionally. So as a community, let's get together. And this is what we did for the Jordan Downs project. We, we work with Jordan Downs as a consultant to help them access money. 
and get the city to prioritize what we want in our community. Uh, prioritize that money for affordable housing that's set aside either through CDBG, uh, uh, through um, their allocation of tax credits and the money that's in our general fund is prioritized for Crenshaw District. That's gonna be a fight. We have to advocate. That's what other communities do. So if we want to see uh, between the two pro properties, uh, 500 units or 600 units or 800 units of affordable housing, we've got to fight for that at the city level. So that's a coalition building that we need to start now. The, the new money that's on the street is coming out in March. If we don't get into that March uh, deadline, I don't know if you're applying for um, the sustainable housing money uh, for control crossing, but if we don't get in it, we miss it for another year, year and a half. Then you're waiting down the line. So that's a that's a real thing that needs to happen. Tax credits as well, um, and and then and then we can work to look at uh, when you're talking about community benefits uh, for a project like this. We have to look at allocating money from the general fund for subsidies uh, greater than what we have. We don't have CRA anymore. Uh, but there are some other dollars coming. There's uh, enhanced infrastructure financing districts. Those are things that we can put in place so that we can have money to subsidize what we want to do. But we have to work together to do that. That's one thing. And then Dolores, I know you're still on the line. Uh, I think it's important for us to, to talk about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, what it means to, to build affordable housing. We need that conversation because we're talking about it at a very high level and it doesn't help us build. And, it, and you know that. Uh, we're all at the same meetings. All of us appear at the same meetings for the same money year over year. So we know it's on the table. That's a real issue. We can't just say we want affordable housing. We have to actually do something to get affordable housing. Uh, and the, the last thing is we need to come together around the hiring programs. As you know, the Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Plaza has a uh, community benefits plan in place that was designed by the community and signed off by the mayor already. I can send it out, uh, what it requires, but in there is a $2 million uh, fund, uh, money that has to go check, that has to go to trade tech for local job hiring so we can prepare people to work. That should be something that's used across all of the developments because uh, we're gonna be pulling from the same pool of, uh, of people who need to work. So let's train together and work together across our community uh, in terms of a strategy. And again, that's something where we come together. I know Joe Rosanne's on the call, a community build, that's an urban league. They'll work to do that, but it can't, it doesn't work as well when you say local hire and you've got com competing programs and then also maybe not the best training. If we all put our resources together. We can have state-of-the-art training, training people for future jobs who know how to deal with historic components that we'll have at the mall, who know how to do with sustainability, green building. All those things are things that need to be trained for. We just can't plop people into a job. And let me thank Sharif for that. Let me just say to everybody who's still on the call, uh, we, UHA, will throw our full weight and support behind any kind of collective effort that involves us linking up with our neighbors in Leimert Park, uh, Inglewood, uh, Hyde Park, Crenshaw, Jefferson Park, whatever other park I'm forgetting in the rest of the neighborhood because this is critical for us to come together as Cherie said, identify the resources that we need to go after and then come up with an agenda that makes sense for all. We have all these different interests and everybody, you know, we tend, we're real good at battling, but we're not real good at coming together and focusing that battle on where it really needs to go. And Jen, while you're here as well, you know, I know you can't speak for what necessarily, but I'm sure given you guys commitment to get this project done, you know, your company and others like you that are interested in doing business in South LA, would be interested in putting your shoulder to the wheel on that effort as well. So, you know, we all, we have a common interest here that we can all push toward and, and make some good things happen for the community. Absolutely. And I, I, I wanna thank you, Shree, for, for talking about the practical uh, complexities and challenges that, that are, they're real. There are limited subsidies. We're, everybody's competing for the same money uh, to get in the pipeline, even to, to, to be able to apply for competitive public resources, you know, it can take years to put together. So, um, you know, we're up for the challenge. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time and feedback today. And we'll be, we're not going anywhere. I mean, we're, we're out in the community doing these meetings all the time. So, uh, you know, we're, we're open to ideas. We're open to people sharing their pro formas and how they're putting their projects together. And we're open to partnerships. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And, uh, and, and thank you, John, for running a very, uh, on point meeting <laughs> on agenda.
Well, thank you, Jen, and thanks to Tony and uh, everybody else who, who participated. You know, we had lots of help to make this happen. You know, Michael, Daryl, Tony McDonald Tabor, our other board members. So, you know, it's a team effort. I want to thank uh, Cherie, Roland, Damien, Philip Hart, uh, anybody else I'm forgetting, Tony Nicholas, you guys uh, being here today was very, very meaningful, inform informative, and important. And uh, again, we have a couple minutes if somebody else has a burning question or, you know, final final point. We have another hand raised. Uh, oh, a couple, a couple, couple more hands. Let me go with Montrese first. Montrese, can you unmute yourself? Let's try, try it again. See if you can unmute. Okay, oh, unmute right. it. Go unmute ahead. it. There we go. Right. Go Thank you. Thank you for taking my question. So my question is uh, directed uh, to uh, Sheree or, or, and whoever else wants to answer this. But um, but since uh, you brought up opportunity zones, I'm, I'm wondering um, if you're envisioning an agreement that gives community ownership that you and your partners are proposing that guarantees that this group, I, I don't know what you're calling it, um, um, has the first right of refusal to purchase the land. I mean, so the opportunity zone sunsets after 10 years in 2027. And so have you, have you imagined what a uh, performer would look like in 10 years if this group were to be able to, to purchase it? It's, it's being purchased at, or it's valued at, what, about a million dollars now? What would it look like in 10 years? And, um, and the other thing, the, I'm just sorry, I, I know that I don't have a lot of time, so I just wanna get all my, points out relative to this, to this, uh, to this issue. So with live work, um, I think we all know that, um, you know, they've, they've done deals with CIM in the past. Um, and so, you know, CIM, they, you know, who's to say that they're not going to come in after 10 years or seven years and decide that they're just going to sell it to, you know, someone that they've already done business with in the past. And then the last thing you 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 suggested or said that you've already started your own um, OZ fund. Um, how I'm just trying to figure out. I, I know this is a very complex and nuanced subject, opportunity zones, but I'm trying to figure out or would like to know how do you envision your fund, your your group's fund, um, allowing the community to invest, or is it just your partners? Now, how does that trickle down? Because you, you can't just invest. I mean, you know, you have to, there, you have to, you know, there are ways that you have to, you know, be able to invest. But I'll stop here and let you go ahead and okay. answer. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, first I'll say you're spot on. Okay. Um, we again, we're not here to be for ourselves. We we have projects all over the country. Uh, we have lots of opportunities to do. So to be here and spend our time is because we're part of it. I live. Uh, basically diagonal across from the mall. I've grown up here. All of our partners have. We're all, uh, Roland's a transplant, but the others, we, we're here. So let's, that, to, to know that. Secondly, um, you're right. What we want to do and the way, way opportunity zones work and Dolores is on the, uh, she's, uh, Dolores uh, is, is a chair of the Clearinghouse CDFI. Um, they are an, a national organization that she's chairing uh, that has a national uh, minority investment fund, as well as an opportunity zone fund. And uh, I don't know if she's speaking, but- um, Sheree, I'm, I'm looking, I don't see her. But, you don't see uh, her? Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll just say this. So, so- If, if Dolores is on and, she, and she's on a yeah. phone line, maybe she can press star nine and you can raise your hand, Dolores, but go ahead. Yeah. Yes. So, so we've already brought those resources to the table because she actually is the chair and she controls those those funds, both on the new markets tax credit and opportunity zone so that we can make sure it gets here. But that is a critical thing between John, myself, Jackie DuPont Walker, a few people in this town, we started structuring tax credit deals. I did my first deal when I was 24 with, with on 27th and Central. And we, we packaged our own tax credit deal. Those last for 15 years. At the end of that period of time, and John will tell you, that's what we have to be prepared. Any of those deals, the nonprofit gets 1%, the investors get 99%, get ready for the end of the period. And that's what we've been structuring. I'm old enough now to be two cycles of, of, of low-income housing tax credits. So what Dolores and I are doing is preparing us to buy out those credits at the end of the period. And that's what we would do 
because you're going to need other people's money. And on the opportunity zone, we're going to use funds. There are some funds, as you know, but we can also make the site itself an opportunity zone. What does that mean? We, it's only one sheet of paper. It is actually not right. <coughs> one sheet of paper filed at the IRS and you make any project an opportunity zone within an opportunity zone. It is. Then you can get with your friends. We can get with our friends of our friends. And we can say, when you roll over money from something else you sell, put it in here. If they feel comfortable with it and they're educated on the risk factors, I hope they do. Uh, I don't have that kind of money to roll over and I will not be doing that because I don't have that. My family's investing in cannabis, as many of you know, and also in our other development projects. But if there are people who wanna do that, we create that vehicle. And we're inviting everybody with expertise to the table, Damien included. We, there's not a day that goes by that Roland doesn't say to me, Sheree, why, how do we partner with Damien? We want him, he's a young, bright mind. I'm 55, I gotta get out of this game. I gotta retire soon. We need those young, bright men. You're not old enough to retire yet. <laughs> yes, I am. Not this that easy. Yeah, mm -hmm. but, but, but those structures, we need to do it both with Opportunity Zone and New Markets Tax Credits. New Markets Tax Credits are even better. I structured a deal with New Markets Tax Credits for the Legal Aid Foundation for their brand new building on Union and um, uh, 8th Avenue. And the beautiful part about that is even though we had to go out and we raised capital through Chase and all those things, the banks have an ability because they make money on the tax rates to forgive a portion of it. So you're actually getting equity back and then it can go back to uh, the operators. Uh, as you know, there is a, there's a, 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 we're involved in the new, new um, project right there on Stalker. Uh, uh, we'll be working with them to make sure we have community involvement. It's a black contractor, black architect. Uh, as, you know, Stan Washington is leading that project to build new studios right here in our community. And what happens at the end of that 10 year period, we've got to start to get together. We have to educate each other on how to do that. I implore everybody, if, if you, if I don't know the name of the young woman speaking, you sound like you're the perfect person to lead that effort. We, it's a monumentous task for us to do all of these. Where it is not, we can't just talk about this. We've got to come together and work on these tasks. So let's create our opportunity zone. Let's go interview people who have money to invest in opportunity zones. There's a list. We call them, we know who they are. Some of them fit our ethos, some of them don't. That's a task. And then how it works on which project. The site has really weird parcels. You've got to think about that too. Only some of them are parcelized so that you can actually finance them independently. We can think about that as a structure because that might be a way. So um, I look forward to the opportunity. I I'm a master at developing performance. Uh, we developed the first for, uh, housing on Central Avenue we did a shopping center right there on Slauson Essential. It generates $50 million a month. Joe Rosanne is on the call. Vermont Slauson owns the shopping centers on Slauson and Vermont. And I know if you drive down Slauson, you can't even get by the street. Why? Because everybody's going into his shopping centers. So you have people who understand the market in this transaction and we can come together and start doing that. But we've got to get past this notion that we're not all on the same team. That is, that is just simply not true. And let me, thanks Sheree, let me suggest that I know you put your information in the chat, but Montrese, and I apologize, I don't know, don't know your name either, but if you want to privately, you know, ping Sheree through the chat, give her your contact info, I'm sure she'll circle back with you and, and vice versa. Uh, I saw another hand from someone it, named- It was R-H-A-H. -H. This has been right, up for a right. long time. And, and, they and I don't their, know if they're still waiting they or put not. put their hand down. Let me, Ross, I'm, I'm unmuting you. Did you still have a question? No? Okay. Let me, okay. Sorry, Ross. I, I, <laughs> I hit unmute too fast. Try it again. Ross, can you unmute yourself? Try one more time, Ross, unmute. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Ross, did you still have a question? Hi, this is Dolores Brown. Oh, it's Dolores. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> it is Dolores. Dolores is hiding behind an acronym I didn't recognize. All right, Dolores. Yes, great. Thank you so much. This has been a, a very informative talk. And thank you, John, for really facilitating. Uh, it's been, been a, a wonderful time period for people to really start to 
um, start to glean the facts. I, I just wanted to um, really stress and really put us back to the place of thinking about this, that this is a financial deal structure that has to feasibly make sense. When we were talking about looking at the overview of, of um, tax credits and looking at even the overview of bringing in investors, right? If we are strategically aligning together, there's only so much capital and so much capital stacking to go around in a particular community, right? And so we want to make sure that as we begin to build these bridges and we open the doors to start having a conversation, that we, we really look at how do we do the highest and best use of the dollars that can be infused into our communities. Um, when we talked about the affordability index, right, of really focusing on that 80%, when we look at um, having the ability to sit down and to do a perform of the, on a deal. At the end of the day, the deal has to pencil. It, and so when we're looking at talking about subsidies, right? Um, Cherie really hit, you know, hit on the point of talking about, you know, there, there are lots of other deals that are in the pipeline, right? So where do we get in line for those subsidies? Um, and that true holds holds true when we're thinking about from the capital stacking. One of the areas that we've really focused in is being able to think about what were the investment opportunities. Is the investment opportunity on the front end of the transaction or do we strategically and very creatively think about on the back end when we're talking about new markets, tax credits and opportunity zone transactions of positioning ourselves to be in that takeout a mode and have ourselves really looking at does you know the ability to take on the ownership on the back end when it is a, an appreciative you know it's gain appreciation and value and it becomes a long term performing asset. I, I want everyone to kind of focus on the mall right now that it is a non-performing asset. And when we're thinking about this transaction, we're bringing, and uh, all of us collectively have to put on our best case hats to think about how do we move it from non-performing for 40 years to being in a position that even when we get to year 10, have we stabilized the transaction enough to say that it's going to be a performing asset. So, uh, you know, if there's a lot of moving parts that has to take place as we're thinking about um, the financial feasibility of these projects. Um, and I just want, you know, for us to be able to begin to educate our community about this, to kind of remove the emotionalism from it and really look at at the end of the day that it has to be a transaction that pencils. It has a lot to do with right now, the cost of construction. You know, um, Danny Tabor and I are in a transaction right now in Long Beach, where we're looking at a cost factor of $600,000 you know, per unit to build one unit. Right. So how do you back into those numbers when we're talking about creating um, the ability to look at, um, you know, very low income housing? How do you support that transaction so that day one, when you open that transaction, that you can have the project remain open? So there's a lot of moving factors that I think that are, you know, it's going to be very become crucial for our community to be educated about in reference to when we're talking about development. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dolores. Point well mm -hmm. taken. And that is, I mean, you know, we can have all the, uh, the political, cultural and other goals that we want. But, you know, as somebody says, if it doesn't make dollars, it doesn't make sense. So whatever our strategy or our tactic or our approach is, we have to make sure that, uh, whatever we're talking about makes sense from, from a business execution standpoint. Um, and someone in the chat asked Dolores Brown, is, is Dolores' last name? I'll just say it instead of typing it. Any other uh, critical points or questions before we wrap this up, folks? I don't see any, John. All right. Well, hey, before somebody thinks of something, let me, let me just say again, <laughs> Uh, appreciate everybody. Let me make sure I'm going to read read through the list so I don't miss anybody this time. Uh, um, let me get let me get all my lists here. 
So Sharif Franklin, Roland Wiley, Dolores Brown, Brenda Curry, uh, and obviously we know um, part of the Live Work team couldn't be here, but thank you guys for being here. Damian Goodman, Philip Hart, other folks from downtown Crenshaw Rising, thank you guys for being here. Uh, Jen, Tony, um, the folks from uh, West Angeles CDC, I think Patrice, am I, am I remembering her name right? Um, we appreciate you guys all being here and taking time. And of course, my fellow board members, Richard, Joanne, Michael, Daryl, Tony, Aaron, uh, Helen, we appreciate you guys as well. Neighbors, thanks. You guys enjoy your weekend, stay safe, wear your masks, stay socially distant and um, stay strong. And we will, we will definitely follow up because we have more work to do on this point. So let's stay connected, all right? Thanks guys, take care. Take care.